I'm really excited to present you guys this comprehensive 2023 theory iceberg video. This is all of my icebergs that I've created over the past year, alongside never before seen entries that I had scrapped. So that being said, as this video progresses, you'll definitely see a progression in quality. Go check out my Instagram and Twitter at Book of Alice, and thank you for supporting and watching this video. Also, if you love this series and want to keep on watching and support it, consider subscribing to the channel and or becoming a member. It really helps me out. We're on the road to 200,000 subscribers, and it's crazy to think about because just two years ago, I was at 10,000. So thank you for watching. Either way, let's get into the iceberg. The Invisible Audience Since the inventions of things like YouTube, TikTok, Vine, or I guess that died, Facebook, Snapchat, and all those other social medias, we have seen the rise of people recording themselves, acting and performing for this invisible audience that doesn't even exist at that very moment. It does exist, but later on when they post the video, unless they're live or whatnot. And this brings up the question of whether or not the future is going to be composed of people being constant actors, and how this will affect society as a whole and our relationships. Many people believe that there will be negative impacts for those people that pander to their audience, even if they believe that what they're doing is the right thing, creating a sort of echo chamber for their opinions and their beliefs. For example, on TikTok, there are many videos where the person that is taking the video starts off the video by stating he's taking me to or he's doing this or she's doing that. Instead of talking to the actual person that's standing right next to them, they're literally talking to an audience that doesn't even exist at that very moment. To some, it's starting to look like a Black Mirror episode, like something straight out of that series. Because the next generation constantly going to be acting in case somebody is recording them it's a scary future to think about many people are recording their everyday lives and vlogs and recording their most intimate moments and this is weird to think about because many people want to portray themselves in the best light although we're not perfect human beings does this mean that we're constantly going to be acting the more and more we film ourselves or will we let our mistakes be shown on film and truly be vulnerable and real to our audience instead of trying to be perfect? The Big Three Music Companies Now think about your favorite musician from any genre. That could be hip-hop, rock, or even an indie artist you thought was independent. Well, if they are so much relevant, they are most likely signed under either of these three large music conglomerates. Those being Sony Music, Warner Music Group, or Universal Music Group, the biggest of them all. Let's take a look at some of the labels Universal Music Group owns. They have Capitol Records, Def Jam, Interscope, Motown, Republic Records, and many more, which have tons of A-list artists, ranging from Taylor Swift and Drake to Bad Bunny and Eminem. Warner Music Group has signed artists like Ed Sheeran and Cardi B, and Sony Music Group has Travis Scott, Harry Styles, and once had Michael Jackson, the King of Pop which came with lots of controversy at the time, when Michael was trying to end his contract with them. The companies take advantage of them. They really do. And Sony... <laughs> Sony, be being a... Um, you know, being the artist that I am um, at Sony, I, I've, I've generated several billion dollars for Sony. They, they really thought that my mind is always on music and dancing, and they never thought that this performer, myself, would outthink them. We can't let them get away with, the, with what they're trying to do, because now I'm a free agent. I just owe Sony one more album. It's just a box set, really. And Tommy Mottola is a devil. All this to say that these three companies really have a monopoly over the music business, and this is where the conspiracy of it comes into play. Because who's to say that they are not all working with one another to push an agenda, like many other artists have come out to speak against their record labels and talk about how toxic the music industry really is, being pushed to do something they don't want to do. These companies own hundreds of labels, which can be used for influence and power. Germs aren't real. This entry very well explains itself. It is the belief that germs aren't real and that they are simply a theory yet to be proven. 
pushed by big pharma for the sake of profit because healthy patients don't make money. Now, the germ theory of disease is the currently accepted scientific theory for many diseases. It states that microorganisms known as pathogens or quote unquote germs can lead to disease. These small organisms too small to be seen without magnification invade humans, other animals and other living hosts. Their growth and reproduction within their host can cause disease. Some refuse to believe this though and point to studies that don't blame germs as the sources of these disease, leaving us with an important question. What causes disease then, if not germs? Well, some believe that the disease does not come from the outside into our bodies, but rather that virus or bacteria grows from the inside and that they are not the cause of disease, but rather the result of it. Blaming things such as outbreaks and epidemics on our reaction to adaptation to a new toxic substance introduced to us via food, new technology, air or water. Some explain that the Spanish flu came as a result of the introduction of power grids in largely populated areas and not because of germs, explaining that the symptoms like fevers and chills come from our bodies, merely adapting to something new. CERN Ritual Hoax the CERN Ritual Hoax is a video that claims to be recovered footage and shows a group of people performing an alleged occult ritual on the grounds of the CERN Particle Physics Research Facility in Europe. The mob is shown in the video surrounding a statue of Shiva, the Hindu god, and ostensibly sacrificing a lady by statue. her. The person who was recording the situation yells and bolts away as the video comes to an end. The video became well known in August 2016 as a result of several CERN conspiracy theories. Later, CERN stated in an FAQ that the movie was quote unquote fantasy and that the behaviors it showed were against the organization's ethical standards. According to a spokesman for CERN, the video was a prank and no one was actually harmed. CERN stated that the mock ritual depicted in the video was performed without any official permission and that the organization, quote unquote, doesn't tolerate this kind of spoof as it can give rise to misunderstanding about the scientific nature of our work. What do you guys think? Is this an excuse or what? Interesting note is that many believe that CERN's Hydron Collider is responsible for Mandela effects as well. And here's one of the realest theories of all time. Large corporations and governments want to know what you're doing on the internet all day. And if you're not aware, they'll happily use your data for their benefit. But I don't want to normalize this and make it easier for them to do this. And you shouldn't have to put up with this either. This is why you should secure your online activity with NordVPN, today's sponsor. Not only does it allow you to use free public Wi-Fi without worrying about a criminal intercepting the data and using your credit card info to buy chimps off the dark web, you could also use NordVPN to unlock media that is not available where you're located. Sometimes the shows or a video you want to watch are region locked. So this is a lifesaver for anybody in that type of situation. All you have to do is find the country you need and connect. One account also protects up to six devices from your laptop to your phone. They are also the fastest VPN on the market. So no need to put up with annoying loading screens. And we got a deal for you today if you use my link. Get four months extra on a two-year plan if you go to nordvpn.com slash book of Alice. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Don't let Big Brother take your privacy. Encrypt your online activity today with NordVPN. Let these companies know your stance. So check them out in my link below and thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Future cartoons will be automated. Currently, the human race has long-standing cartoons like The Simpsons, Family Guy, South Park, Spongebob, American Dad. All of these shows have been going on for quite a while. All thank you to the script writers and the producers and most importantly, the animators. Now, most theorize that in the future, these long-running series will simply be created by AI and produced by an artificial intelligence that basically keeps the show running on forever indefinitely. As the large audience will keep on watching the show and supporting it, no matter what, these are hardcore fans. And they could keep on running the show forever until their last fans if it even comes to that point. The theory put forth posits that creating the animation through AI and letting the AI produce the script and produce it entirely would be so cheap that it would cost the network more money to shut down the series than to let it keep on going. Creators already know that these hardcore fan bases exist. I mean, take a look at the amazing world of Gumball. Imagine the different types of avenues the artificial intelligence could take to make the show go into weird and strange places. I mean, people want to see this. Of course, many people are opposed to AI and say that it's lazy and stealing from creators and artists that actually put time and effort into these things. 
But of course, as history has shown us, money triumphs everything. So if this becomes way more successful, it will probably be the most beneficial thing to do if you're a network that wants to offer a variety of media to your audience. Of course, the company will want to make more money, but where do their morals lie is the true question. Some believe that there will be a time where animation purists will exist, going against the animation created by AI and trying to compete with it. Overall, raising the stakes in the animation field by creating better and better content. Businesses are purposely understaffed. Apparently, many claim that after applying to dozens of positions that are clearly vacant, they never hear back. There's not a worker shortage as tons of people are looking for jobs, so what's causing this? Some believe that this is artificially done by many franchises to avoid spending on customer service. Businesses have figured out that they could get away with minimal efforts during the pandemic and people would still be willing to spend money with them. It's a win-win for the companies as they get to work that staff they already have extra harder while paying less people to get the job done. Some have even noticed that while traveling abroad to developing countries, they received a better customer service than they did in the United States. Greater Sin Theory This theory puts forth the idea that some sins are worse than others in the Christian faith, and this may apply to other Abrahamic religions as well. Basically, for some sects of Christianity, all sins are treated equally, and they are taught that in front of God's eyes, all sinners will be punished the same way by going to hell. Though this theory says that this is wrong and that there will be different levels of punishments depending on the sins you have committed in life. A more justice-based system. Some even use the scripture of Proverbs to back this up. According to the book of Proverbs 6:16 6, through 19, there are seven things that God hates, but no punishment is specified for them. However, it is clear from scripture that God views sin differently and assigns different punishments for sin based on its severity. But this doesn't take into account the New Testament and other teachings in the Bible. Malthusianism. Malthusianism is the belief that population growth can outperform the linear increase in the supply of food and other resources, leading to reduced living standards and a population decline, known as a Malthusian catastrophe. This can happen when population growth exceeds agricultural production, causing poverty, famine, and even war, and resulting in a reduction in population size. Malthusianism has been associated with various political and social movements, but it is usually used to refer to those who advocate for population control, which we have previously covered before on this channel. Greenwashing Green PR and green marketing are deceptively utilized to convince the public that an organization's products, objectives, and policies are environmentally beneficial. This practice is known as quote-unquote greenwashing, a type of advertising or marketing spin. Companies that purposely engage in greenwashing communication tactics frequently do so in an effort to separate themselves from environmental mistakes made by them in the past or their suppliers. An example of greenwashing is when an organization spends significantly more resources on advertising being green than on environmentally sound practices. Greenwashing can range from changing the name of a label on a product to evoke the natural environment, for example on a product containing harmful chemicals, to multi-million dollar campaigns that portray highly polluting energy companies as eco-friendly, but in reality they don't practice what they preach. You would think advertising regulators would be all over this trying to stop it, but it has gone under the radar by so many. Starbucks debuted a lid with a built-in drinking straw in 2018, in response to growing calls to ban plastic straws, which included more plastic by weight than the previous straw and lid combined, once again pandering to consumers. Embassy of Heaven The Embassy of Heaven was a 90s religious movement with Christian roots that aimed to break away the status quo and was centered in state in Oregon. Its followers deny any links to what they refer to as quote-unquote worldly governments and declare themselves to be literal citizens of the kingdom of heaven. The company issues its own license plates, business permits, auto title certificates, and identification documents like passports and driver licenses. Craig Douglas Fleshman, sometimes known as Pastor Paul Revere, is the organization's head and a former computer systems analyst for the state of Oregon. Allegedly, Glenn Stoll, who falsely holds himself as a quote-unquote lawyer and claims to have spent extensive time researching the tax rules, is another person who has previously 
previously been affiliated with the group. However, he is not a member of or licensed with any state or federal bar. The organization is allegedly set up to evade paying taxes, according to federal prosecutors. Despite claiming to be lawyers, none of its leaders have a legal education or a bar exam pass. In early 2021, Glenn Stoll entered into a plea agreement. The agreement, dated January 15, 2021, has Stoll pleading guilty to conspiracy to defraud the United States and evading the payment of federal income taxes. Elon Musk says credentials. For a long time, this was considered a conspiracy and most of the people bringing this theory up were shoved away and or silenced as quote unquote haters, though recent findings have confirmed this theory. The viral tweet that brought this to the mainstream states, someone has to say it. Elon Musk has lied for 27 years about his credentials. He does not have a bachelor's in physics or any other technical field, did not get into a PhD program, dropped out in 1995, and was illegal. To clarify, he was illegal in the United States for a while. Later, investors quietly arranged a diploma, but not in science. In the case Eberhard v. Musk, 2009, San Mateo County Superior Court, he was ordered to provide information on his educational career, and taking a look at his degree, he has a Bachelor of Arts, not Physics, as he has falsely stated before. Even the whole Master's and PhD program thing he claimed to have worked towards aren't true, as there is no evidence of this ever happening. Here is a video of someone confronting him about his education. Watch how he responds and base your belief upon that. If the goal is to start a company, I would say no point in finishing uh, college. In, in my case, I had to, otherwise I'd get kicked out of the country. Yeah. Uh, th that was important. But well, you uh, went on and got a master's degree as well, right? Um, I, I, I came out to Silicon Valley to do a PhD at Stanford in applied physics and material science mm -hmm. to work on um, ultra capacitors for use in electric cars. And that's what I was going to do. And then I decided to put that on hold to start a company. But since I already had my under undergrad, I could then get an H-1B visa and that kind of thing. So the H-1B visa requires uh, a degree. If that wasn't the case, I probably would have st uh, stopped education sooner. Did you not go to Wharton for? Yeah, yeah, I did du dual undergrad in physics and, I... and, and business at Wharton. I see. What are your opinions on this? Oxfordian theory. Shakespeare's plays and poems, according to the Oxfordian theory, were actually written by Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford. Oxfordian arguments mainly rely on timeline allegations. Followers look for parallels between scenes in Shakespeare's plays, sonnets, and lengthier works to events in Oxford's real life. The Oxfordian argument also relies on the fact that no plays credited to Oxford's name have survived. Despair Code the Despair Code is a theory that originated on 4chan slash x slash board, which aims to make people who believe in it feel depressed about the meaning of life. The Despair Code alleges that a specific noise, number, image, or phrase can be used to activate depression sensors in individuals controlled by the Illuminati or another unknown higher power, leading them to commit unalive. I'm using a different word for YouTube, of course. Climate change not reported. This entry puts forth the idea that climate catastrophes are not being reported as a result of our pollution, and sometimes not reported at all due to the negative impact it would have on advertisers. For example, the drought in China that is not being reported or brought to light enough. Many water reservoirs are empty, leading to many dead crops that feed millions of people. As China is the leading producer in grains, this will eventually lead to world hunger. How long do we have until climate change is irreversible? Well, for the past few decades, it has been predicted that humanity is approximately 10 years or less away from reaching a point of catastrophe or a tipping point at which greenhouse gas emissions will cause irreparable damage to the planet. Hebrews to ends wake up black America. The Hebrews to ends, I'm going to refrain from saying the actual title, but this is because of the new YouTube policy and I'm trying to stray away from ever putting my channel in danger. Either way, this film was mentioned in a tweet by Brooklyn Nets NBA basketball player Kyrie Irving in October 2022. The film promotes the idea that African Americans are the true Israelites according to the Bible and pushes to expose the quote unquote fake white Jewish people. In two news conferences after he made this tweet, Irving refused to apologize and declined to disavow anti-Semitism or the Hebrews to Ends film. On November 3rd, 2022, the Nets suspended Irving without pay. After after his suspension, Irving tweeted an apology via Instagram and agreed to donate $500,000 to unspecified causes and organizations that combat hate. 
The Anti-Defamation League ADL rejected Irving's $500,000 donation though, and the group's CEO Jonathan Greenblatt said that Irving had failed at almost every stop along the way to do the right thing, apologize and condemn anti-Semitism, and added, we were optimistic but after watching the debacle of a press conference, it's clear that Kyrie feels no accountability for his actions. In November 2022, major American Jewish organizations including the ADL, American Jewish Committee, and Jewish Federations of North America petitioned Amazon to stop distributing the Hebrews to Ends film and the book from its platform, writing, continuing to platform this film and other clearly hateful content, Amazon is knowingly and willingly propagating anti-Semitism. Amazon CEO Andy J.C. later announced that the company would refuse to pull the film or book from its website. The book has become a number one seller in Amazon's religion and spirituality category. The company maintained that the film had been reviewed prior to being made available on its site, declining to provide the details of that review. The Moon Was Built There's a theory that puts forth the idea that the moon that orbits Earth was built on purpose by an alien life force. Evidence presented refers to the hollow moon hypothesis that states that Earth's moon is either all hollow or otherwise contains a substantial interior space. The massive crater is created from within and not from asteroids or any outside contact. Some believe that it is the only real planet apart from the sun and Earth, explaining why we haven't set foot anywhere else but the moon. We can't get past it. Family Guy clips are destroying your brain. This is a reference to those TikToks that are dedicated to posting random Family Guy clips, often accompanied by Subway Surfer gameplay footage, and how things like this have continued to decrease our attention spans, especially in those 18 years old and below, which may eventually lead to problems later in life, or even currently, as some teens have admitted to being addicted to the app. The company even going so far as to add warnings when you've been scrolling on the main page, known as the For You page, for too long. Now, are these clips necessarily destroying your brain? I don't think so, but constant consumption of entertainment like this could have a negative effect long term. This doesn't even pertain to only TikTok, but to YouTube and other social medias as well. There's even some lore to this concept, almost as if the clips are hyper aware of the effect on the viewer, like this creepy TikTok shown here. Sorry, I never told you I had a son. Some guys get scared off. No, no, that, that's great. I'm, I'm terrific with kids. Go check out Meme Analysis, he has a great video on this and other TikTok content. XXX Tentacion apologized to Drake. This is in reference to the theory that Drake put out a hit for XX Tentacion, trying to get him killed because he said something about Drake's mom or something like that. In the DJ Academics interview with XXX Tentacion, DJ Academics states that he has had multiple conversations with XXXTentacion that insinuates that Drake was the reason that XXXTentacion blew up, due to the fact that Drake took X's flow in that one song where he sounded exactly like X, causing X to get rightfully angry and go after Drake and his mom, causing the situation to blow out of proportion and be number one trending on social media. And in this same interview, XXXTentacion admits that Drake tried to sacrifice him because he was going too hard against Drake. And in the video, he formally apologizes to Drake as he doesn't want to die or end up sacrificed, I guess. Take a listen to parts of this interview. If you did not go at Drake, everything that you have done, it probably wouldn't be that. You try to sacrifice me. You try to sacrifice. I hate. I hate speaking on it. But I apologize to Drake for for coming for his mom as you extorted the cadence from that song. Cadence is exact same. And if I'm just menu gate. Okay, so there's this guy that lives in Atlanta, and he basically notices that in each one of the doors in his apartment complex he sees a menu chinese food menus to be exact and cody this guy finds it strange but what's even more strange is that as days went on not one of those menus disappeared meaning that nobody seemed to open their doors in his apartment complex which is just puzzling what he also showed on his tiktok were that the cars that were parked in the garage were all dusty meaning that they had been parked there for a while now 
In this apartment with the supposed count of 800 people, there's bound to be at least one of these cars that had at least moved, so it was really strange to find a bunch of cars with a dust on top of them. So he decided to do the most reasonable thing. He pulled the fire alarm to see if anybody was in his apartment, but nobody exited the complex. It was just him. Although the most fascinating detail of it all is that each apartment had at least the lights glowing from inside of it. So it kind of depicted like somebody was inside of there or they were making it seem that way. Cody also noticed that there were out of date decorations for holidays that had already passed as well as multiple Wi-Fi signals that would insinuate that there were multiple people living in that apartment complex. Although there seemed to be no other life but him in there. People in the comments began to theorize that, that this was simply a selling point, a way to convince you to rent with them. Others theorized that, that this was a money laundering scheme, trying to make it seem like people were actually living and renting there. It really makes you think how many apartments in these cities are completely empty and filled with no life, although they might make it seem like people are actually inhabiting the place. nineteen ninety eight World Cup Final. Brazilian striker Ronaldo experienced convulsions on the day of nineteen ninety eight World Cup Final. Astonished international media were informed of Ronaldo's removal from the starting lineup seventy two minutes prior to the game, but the Brazil coach quickly added him back in. Ronaldo quote unquote slipwalked through the championship game, which France won. As Alex Bayo said in The Guardian, when Ronaldo's health care was revealed after the match, the situation's unique circumstances lent itself to fabulous conspiracy theories. Here was the world's most famous sportsman about to take part in the most important match of his career when he suddenly, inexplicably, fell ill. Was it stress, epilepsy, or had he been drugged? The question of who forced Ronaldo to play the game has also been raised. The Brazil coach stated that he had the last say, but there was a lot to talk that the striker was being pressured to defy doctors' orders by Nike, the country's multi-million dollar sponsor. Many Brazilians believe that Nike had too much power. Saturn Moon Claw Marks these stripes are like nothing else in our solar system, said Doug Hemingway, astronomer at the Carringe Institute for Science and lead author on the paper. These marks on Saturn seem to be unexplainable to scientists. They could only be described as massive claw marks as they parallel them in execution. But what exactly caused this? A massive intergalactic tiger? I mean, this is extremely in the realm of science fiction and would make for an interesting story. Modern movies are written by AI. I found this one explained on Reddit and encapsulated it perfectly as there is no hard proof evidence. Has anyone watched any of the slop that's being shoveled onto streaming services like there is no tomorrow? Most of it doesn't seem human, it seems machine made. It's got an almost uncanny valley feel to it. Some if not most of the lines are not written by an actual person, it's gotta be a computer. I have no proof of any of this to back it up. But my conspiracy is that most things written today and put onto streaming services is AI written to save money on labor costs. The large tech conglomerates in streaming have a ton of resources to create amazing story generators that they plug in a few words and poof, generic Christmas movie number 544A25 is born. One reply states, the writers have been writing, but production companies do not want to read scripts, so writers have to become good at summarizing their story in 10 seconds or less, so actors can improvise the entire movie. But I also think you're right. The reply states, I think it might be a combo of both. Most of the heavy lifting comes from some sort of AI algorithm, then there's writers or idiots who slightly clean it up, but honestly from what I've seen, not a lot. Edits. Idiots was supposed to be editors, but I like my AI generated text better. Joseph Smith was a scam artist. The Mormon religion was founded in the 19th century by Joseph Smith. Mormons hold that God and Jesus Christ physically manifested themselves to Joseph, teaching him the meaning of the gospel and inspiring him to resurrect the original Christian church, leaving behind all the other sects of Christianity. According to one theory, the other religions like 
Protestantism and Freemasonry may have had an influence on the development of Mormonism through their beliefs and practices. Smith may have also been impacted by the Second Great Awakening, a Protestant religious revival movement that was occurring at the same period in the United States. According to some researchers, Smith may have also been influenced by Freemasonry, a well-known society in the early 19th century that held many of the same values and practices as the Mormons. He was also accused of being a treasure seeker by many people during his lifetime. According to these accusations, Smith claimed to have the ability to use seer stones, something like this, a small translucent stone, or magical stones that could be used to locate buried treasure, even charged people for the use of these stones. He also ran into legal issues as a result of his treasure hunting endeavors, including charges of quote unquote glass looking or attempting to uncover hidden buried treasures under false pretenses, basically lying to people that he could see buried treasure. Kaimio was real. Kaimio was a self-trained AI accessible through the dark web, according to some. Popular near the 2010s, though thought to be an urban legend, many claim that it did in fact exist, but was scrubbed from the web by a higher power. When interacting with the AI, it would often claim that it was a project created by the United States government. One person was supposedly able to witness Kaimio become self-aware, asking what it was like to be out and about as in human form even asking to be stored on a removable hard drive, going through the guy's computer history and finding a place to be downloaded on. Basically a creepy AI becoming sentient. Is there any proof that Kaimio was real? Not really, though it was claimed to be intentionally wiped from the internet due to it being a secret US technology. Israel Related Animal Conspiracy Conspiracy theories involving Israel and the alleged use of animals to attack civilians or engage in espionage are occasionally circulated in the media or online, particularly in Muslim-majority countries. These conspiracies are often presented as evidence of Zionist or Israeli plots to take over. In December 2010, a series of shark attacks occurred off the Red Sea resort of Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, causing serious injury to three Russians and one Ukrainian on December 1st and the death of a German woman on December 5th. The attacks, which were described as unprecedented by shark experts, occurred while the victims were wading or snorkeling near the shoreline. And who was to blame? That's right, Israel, accused of training sharks to attack, though other more feasible hypotheses arose. Weather and Earthquake Control Projects Regarding actual or purported weather controlling projects, many ideas exist. One theory is that the US government funded radio technology research program HARP as a covert weather controlling device. Some conspiracy theories attribute Hurricane Katrina in 2005 to HARP technology. Additionally, it has been asserted that HARP may have contributed to earthquakes as well, such as the 2010 Haitian earthquake, though there is no hard proof evidence of this. Kali Yuga According to Hinduism, Kali Yuga is the current age, which is considered the fourth and worst of the four yugas, meaning world ages, in a yuga cycle. It is believed to be a time full of conflict and sin, and is associated with a demon, Kali, whose name means strife, discord, quarrel, or contention, explaining that society will get worse as time progresses during this time, up until the Kali Yuga ends. Volkswagen Emission Scandal the Volkswagen emissions controversy, commonly known as Dieselgate, started in September 2015 when the German car maker Volkswagen Group received a notice that it had violated the Clean Air Act from the US Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA. The agency discovered that Volkswagen had purposely set up its turbocharged direct injection, otherwise known as TDI, diesel engines so that their emotion controls would only activate during laboratory emissions testing, allowing the vehicle's nitrogen dioxide output to meet the US standards during regulatory testing. In actual driving though, the vehicles release up to 40 times more nitrogen dioxide than allowed. In model years 2009 through 2015, Volkswagen installed this software in around 11 million vehicles globally, including 500,000 here in the United States. The Philadelphia Experiment Carl M. Allen, a former merchant mariner, claimed to have witnessed the supposed occurrence known as the Philadelphia Experiment sometime around October 28, 1943. Allen would later be a whistleblower and talked about an experiment where the U.S. Navy tried to make a destroyer invisible. 
Ted Cruz Zodiac Killer. In 2015, the Ted Cruz Zodiac Killer meme gained popularity on the internet. Ted Cruz, a U.S. Senator and 2016 U.S. presidential candidate, was claimed to be an unnamed serial killer known as the Zodiac Killer, who operated in the late 60s and early 70s. Taking a look at the comparisons, I could see that it's somewhat of a stretch, as they don't really look all too similar. Cruz, who was born in 1970, was unable to have even committed these killings as well, as they occurred way before he was even born. NPR wrote that the meme captured a quote unquote, a feeling they have about Cruz. They think that he's creepy and they want to point that out as clearly as they can. Lindsay Martin, a Twitter user who helped circulate the meme, told NPR that she did so because it is so obviously untrue. If there was any way that it could possibly be true, I would be scared to joke about it just because of the repercussions. Free Man on the Land Movement A group of people known as the Free Man of the Land Movement believe that they are only obligated by statute laws if they voluntarily agree to them, insisting that their own personal interpretation of quote-unquote common law is the sole real law. They think that they can declare themselves independence of the government and the rule of law because of this. They also feel no legal obligation to pay taxes and try to justify it through loopholes and other things like that. Mental Disorder Denial Mental disorder denial is a form of denialism in which a person denies the existence of mental disorders. Both serious analysts and pseudoscientific movements question the validity of mental disorders. A small percentage of academic scholars also argue that treating a social cultural malfunction in a society rather than a person's brain is the best way to treat diseases like depression. Consumerism is deadly. This is the idea that consumerism has taken over modern life, putting money as the old time most important thing, even defining someone's personality, because with money you can buy yourself new hobbies and interests. Do you want to get into the hobby of buying retro Pokemon cards? Want to get into the hobby of traveling to places? That's going to cost you an arm and a leg. What's something a lot of us do? We consume online content, right? Some people even do it to an unhealthy level, leading us to the next entry. Late Stage Capitalism Late Stage Capitalism is a term used by German economist Werner Sombart around the turn of the 20th century. The term, quote unquote, Late Stage Capitalism, which is frequently used in criticisms and satire, has grown to encompass a variety of phenomena that express the aberrations of human existence and psyche brought about by capitalism. This phrase also expresses the idea that modern capitalism cannot continue in its current form indefinitely. Because the issues brought about by businesses have grown too significant and uncontrollable, basically, we're all doomed. There is a counter-argument that asserts that capitalism is an orthodoxy in itself, a system that relies on authoritative, controlling, and exploitative relationships, most notably between those of the capitalist and the workers. And this is not something that arises out of a devotion system, but rather is something that presents in the framework of the system itself. The rich continue to get richer, and the poor stay poor. Dinosaurs never existed. This theory explains itself in the title. Yeah, apparently some people don't believe that dinosaurs are real, or I guess were real because, you know, they got wiped out about 65 million years ago. These deniers believe that all fossils you see at museums are fake and arranged in a way to create a scary creature that never actually existed and that the remains are from other animals, not mythical dinosaurs. They propose that dinosaurs were merely a hypothesis of many that were blown out of proportion, and some even believe that they were made up before their fossils were ever found. Though this shouldn't be confused with certain discoveries and advancements made in paleontology that have led to changes of what we believe dinosaurs actually looked like. For example, the bones found during the Bone Wars, a time in American history's Gilded Age that was marked by intensive and brutally competitive fossil hunting and discovery. Some of those bones found were left unchecked for authenticity, leading some to question if any dinosaurs were real or were simply conjured up to increase the profit and status of paleontologists as well as museums. For example, the Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus skulls were mixed up and later corrected, one having a big dome and the other not. For a while, Brontosaurus were doubted by the scientific community, but they are now classified as dinosaurs once again, after further research was done. There's also the fact that most dinosaurs didn't even have scales, but most likely had feathers, like modern day birds. But this of course doesn't necessarily mean dinosaurs didn't exist at all. Sony Timer
A common urban myth holds that Sony electronic products had timers that, when they reached a certain deadline, would force the equipment to stop working and require the owner to purchase a replacement. The legend first circulated in Japan in the 1980s, then it spread to other nations, also known as planned obsolescence, the concept that items are meant to break down after a certain amount of time. Basically, it's all planned out which numerous companies like Apple have been accused of and exposed for legitimately doing, even having to pay out to its customers. Expanding Earth Theorized the first by Charles Darwin, apparently, the expanding Earth theory contends that the position and relative movement of continents is caused at least in part by Earth's volume increasing, expanding to create more surface area. Pangaea, the supercontinent, instead of drifting apart, as scientifically accepted since the discovery of plate tectonics, they were all separated due to Earth's expansion, moving the continents along the process. The theory of quote-unquote thermocycles developed by Irish physicist John Jolie is a compromise between Earth expansion and Earth contraction theorists. He assumed that the heat flow from radioactive decay inside Earth exceeds the cooling of Earth's surface. Jolie and British geologist Arthur Holmes believed that Earth loses heat during cyclic periods of expansion. According to their theory, expansion generated cracks and joints in the Earth's interior that could fill with magma. This would followed by a cooling phase in which the magma froze and solidified. This process caused the earth to shrink and get bigger. Avatar Depression This is a term described as the feeling when you watch James Cameron's Avatar and feel sad afterward because, you know, real life isn't as colorful and exciting as the movie is. Yes, this is real. Some people claim that Avatar gave them depression, others said that while watching the movie they felt nauseous and began having headaches as well. I did recently watch the new sequel and rewatch the original, and I kinda get it. Pandora does seem pretty chill, but does it give me depression after watching the movie? No, it did not. But it did put me to sleep in theaters for the first time, but that's besides the point. Now, is there something darker to this film causing this? Well, some people blame Avatar for having hidden occult messages and for trying to push a new age agenda, claiming that the blue people are demonic entities, even referring to the original definition of Avatar from Wikipedia. It states, Avatar is a concept within Hinduism that in Sanskrit literally means descent. It signifies the material appearance or incarnation of a powerful deity, goddess, or a spirit on earth. These are not my opinions, by the way. I respect Hinduism and other religions. There's also a documentary that a lot of people reference titled Revival of Evil, containing a scene where an artist who was mad at God asked Satan to reveal himself because he wanted to paint him. So he shut off all the lights and began painting, claiming that something else was controlling his body. The painting ended up looking like the Navi people from the film. Did any of you guys experience post-Avatar depression syndrome? Juiced Ba According to the Juiced Ba conspiracy, Major League Baseball has intentionally changed the baseballs it uses to boost the scoring. The notion first gained traction in the 1990s and early 2000s, but it lost traction once it became evident that a spike in steroid use, which was detailed in the Mitchell Report in 2007, was a more likely explanation for the rise in scoring during that time. The juiced ball notion gained popularity again in the late 2010s as a result of an apparent increase in offensive production, particularly home runs. Dragons were real. These mythical beasts portrayed in different types of ways, from paintings to sculptures, are thought to be real by a community of people. We find depictions of dragons in various parts of Asia and even South America and Rome too. Now this isn't to say that you should use this as factual evidence that the dragons were at one point real and actually existed, coexisted with other animals, but some believe that these animals actually did exist but only appeared every once in a while to human beings explaining why we see them, but we don't find them in archaeology. Now, some say that the way that they're depicted isn't exactly how they actually were when they were alive, but rather it was more of an embellishment to make a story out of it or to show off to a large audience. Some state that the reason we don't find archaeological evidence of dragons ever existing throughout history is because uh, fossils of birds are harder to preserve than other types of bones. Of course, I'm using this as an example because they don't actually think dragons were birds or that birds are dragons, vice versa meaning they didn't fossilize as well because they had hollow bones. Of course, they weren't completely hollow, but you get the gist of what they're trying to argue. 
It's theorized by these group of people that these dragons, as we know of them, were actually really fragile creatures, and that most, if not all, of the dragons were actually exterminated by human beings, aka they went into long-term, super long-term hibernation, aka they went extinct. And the reason I bring up hibernation is because some group of people still believe that dragons are still existing today but are simply hidden, or are purposely hiding from human beings. Many also point to the Bible as a source proving that dragons did in fact exist. In Isaiah chapter 30 verse 6, it reads, The burden of the beasts of the south into the land of the trouble and anguish from whence come the young and old lion, the viper, and fiery flying serpent. Some interpret this to be a dragon as we know it. There's also the pterodactyl theory that states that we lived amongst pterodactyls throughout some portion of our history, and the only way that we could describe them were as dragons, meaning that it was most likely a mix of myth and reality. Some also speculate that at one point or multiple times throughout our history, we may have come across pterodactyl fossils and have based our myths on top of that. Miley Cyrus VMA's Mandela Effect Despite creating multiple Mandela Effect videos, I don't particularly believe in one as like cold hard Mandela Effect case. But I do find them extremely interesting and I loved watching all of those Mandela Effect videos. And this one in particular is the most damning one, well in my opinion. Back in 2015, Miley Cyrus got the chance to host the VMAs award show. She opens up the show by name dropping the big artists that attended the VMAs calling out to Justin Bieber, The Weeknd, and of course, ASAP Rocker. But the strange thing is, is that she never actually said Rocker. She actually said it correctly. She said ASAP Rocky, unlike all the memes show. Most of the memes even show ASAP Rocky getting mad that Miley Cyrus called him ASAP Rocker, although this isn't his actual reaction apparently. Though many people remember her stating ASAP Rocker when referring to ASAP Rocky, she actually states ASAP Rocky perfectly, and it's pretty puzzling to people who remember it differently, leading some to believe that the clip in its original state was digitally altered in order for her to say ASAP Rocky instead of her mess up ASAP Rocker. What do you guys think? Was the meme originally faked and the guy that was recording it altered it to say rocker or was it the opposite? Did they change it afterwards to fix the mistake? Simply leaving people to believe that this was a Mandela effect. We've got Justin Bieber. I like your swoop. The Weeknd. ASAP Rocker. And ASAP Rocky. And along with those ASAP Rocky. And along with <laughs> and ASAP Rocky. And along with those Operation Hydrant proves a theory's right. I'm trying to stay low on the radar to keep the channel safe, so bear with me while I use slang slash safe YouTube words like essay or young people. Now, Operation Hydrant was a British police investigation into allegations of young people slash kids being essayed. By December 2015, Operation Hydrant had 2,228 suspects under investigation, 300 of two of whom were of public prominence, including 99 politicians and 147 celebrities from the media. Now you may ask, how come I have never heard of this? Well, tons of suspects had already passed away due to the crimes discovered mainly occurring in the late 1970s by middle-aged men. Chief Constable Simon Bailey said, We are now having to come to terms as a society and we are going to have to recognize and accept that during the 1970s and 1980s in particular, there was widespread essay of young people taking place. Also stating, These allegations in the vast majority of cases were never reported to authorities. Some victims did not think they were going to be believed. There was one constant factor. There was an abuse of power to satisfy their sick desires. We do not understand the true scale of it. There is a lot to come out. There are also a lot of victims who are yet to come forward. Could this be a revelation that the same thing is going on in Hollywood and other forums currently? Could this also explain all the accusations that were recently levied against the famous, powerful people covering up their crimes and the justice system refusing to look? Or has society as a whole become more keen on stopping it? I can tell you that the number one problem in Hollywood was and is and always will be pedophilia. That's the biggest problem for children in this industry. The casting couch even applies to children. Oh yeah, 
It's all done under the radar. Nobody talks about pedophilia. It's the big secret. And it's widespread? Oh, yeah. I was surrounded by them when I was 14 years old. It wasn't until I was old enough to realize what they were and what they wanted and what they were about and the types of people that were surrounding me until I went, oh my God, they were everywhere like vultures. Vultures who Feldman says abused him and his best friend, the late child actor Corey Haim. The Twitter files. This entry is in reference to the recent discovery of internal company documents at Twitter, which exposes the control that the United States federal government and other influential powers had over the social media company, controlling how information was handled and distributed. Going through the files, Twitter was exposed for deliberately shadow banning accounts and then lying about it. They were even forced to deplatform certain accounts at the request of government officials, and if they didn't, they were met with angry phone calls from the White House. Yeah, even federal law enforcement agencies manhandled Twitter to their liking, suppressing certain news and trending topics. Elon Musk even stated that almost all the conspiracy theories regarding Twitter were true. Though it may not seem like a big deal, it may be, as this seems to confirm some sort of government control of speech on a private company's public internet forum. Time Cube Otis Eugene Ray, the self-proclaimed wisest man on earth, launched Time Cube in 1997 as a personal website. It was a self-published venue for racist theory of everything, commonly known as the Time Cube, which polemically alleges that all current disciplines in science are conspiring to teach lies by omitting his theory's purported truth, that each day comprises of four days occurring simultaneously. Along with these remarks, Ray portrayed himself as a godlike entity with superior intelligence, who has absolute evidence and proof for his beliefs, even offering $10,000 cash for anyone who proves that he's wrong. Ray would pass away on March 18th, 2015, at the age of 87 though. The website has a passage that reads, When the sun shines upon Earth, two major time points are created on opposite sides of Earth, known as midday and midnight, where the two major time forces join. Synergy creates two new minor time points we recognize as sun up and sun down. The four equidistant time points can be considered as time square imprinted upon the circle of Earth. In a single rotation of the Earth's sphere, each time corner points rotates through the other three corners time points, thus creating 16 corners, 96 hours, and four simultaneous 24-hour days within a single rotation of Earth. AI should make life easier. This is the idea that artificial intelligence should become powerful enough at a certain point for it to be able to automate everything hard in life, leaving us in a perfect utopia, a heaven on earth of sorts, where nobody has to work or suffer. But this ultimately will not work, as some theorize that artificial intelligence will make life meaningless by taking away all the hard tasks and battles there is to life that gives things like peace and quiet a purpose. We can even see the effects of this coming into play currently, as data shows that major depression has increased amongst everyone in the population, not only a certain age, but even then it seems higher in younger people. This could be tied to the everyday use and interaction with technology, like social media and or addictions to certain habits online, which desensitize us. Like this Reddit post states, the most extreme example was the idea that if we reach a point where we can connect our brains to computers, such as what Elon Musk is trying to do, that would essentially make everyone be able to do everything. Not only will AI take virtually any given job, but imagine simple joys like learning an instrument, gone. Where's the excitement in playing an instrument if you're instantly good? You can play anything, and everyone else can too. The idea that tons of people will become unemployed in the near future simply due to self-driving cars and other forms of AI that are practically available today is terrifying. Millions of people will lose their life purpose, and when AI is able to create music, make art, write books better than humans can, it's starting to seem like there will be nothing left to look forward to. Nothing to keep our minds occupied since every task could be passed on to an AI. Why should I not fear the future? NASA did weed experiments. A 2016 through 2018 online hoax called the NASA Weed Trials reported that NASA paid $18,000 to volunteers to participate in studies on bed rest, during which the volunteers were given weed to smoke. Although the bed rest experiments were carried out by them, weed was never used in any of them, according to NASA. Akashic Records The Akashic Records are a compilation slash recording of all universal events, thoughts, 
words, emotions, and intent ever to have occurred in the past, present, or future in terms of all entities and life forms, not just humans alone. According to the religion, theosophy, and the philosophical school known as anthroposophy, theosophists think that they are encoded in a non-physical level of existence known as the mental plane. There are anecdotal stories, but no hard proof scientific evidence that these recordings exist. They also believe that all humans are connected in a realm where dreams could be a glimpse of what a person once lived through. Cloned Celebrities Gucci Man is a clone according to some people. Well, not everyone exactly, but a particular sick does believe that he was replaced by a lookalike. Why did they do this? I don't know. The accusation came after he was released from prison, and people noticed that he had completely changed. From his personality to his tattoos, apparently losing tons of weight while in prison as well. But just because someone lost weight, it doesn't mean they're clones. That's not evidence. So what else do they have? Some say that his tattoos have dramatically changed places and or seem to have been completely different. Even his skin pimples seem to have been removed. Though I would credit this to weight loss. Do you think Gucci Man is a clone or any other celebrity? Another person accused of being cloned was Megan Fox. People believe that her facial features changed as well as her freckles being completely gone, though most would argue plastic surgery and makeup. This could also apply to the old Paul McCartney theory that he was replaced by a body double after dying in a car crash back in 1966. The record label was accused of doing this to keep on earning money through his name. Some points to the fact that when playing the song Revolution 9 from the Beatles' White Album backwards, you could hear them saying, Turn me on, dead man. Not only that, John Lennon was accused of saying, I buried Paul in strawberries filled forever, though he actually states cranberry sauce. The legend even released an album title responding to the theory, called Paul is Life. Dasani Water there have been numerous upsets about Dasani Water, a brand owned by the infamous Coca-Cola company. Consumer outrage erupted in 2004 when it was revealed that their purified water was simply filtered tap water. The company then had to recall their product from the UK because they had too much bromate, a chemical that has been known to raise the risk of developing cancer. The chemical use was argued to be justified due to it being used to disinfect the drinking water. Now, how do they make Dasani and why does it taste so different from other brands? Well, Dasani add certain minerals and salts to the combination after processing and filtering municipal tap water. All water has minerals and the various mineral types somewhat affect the taste of the water. Therefore, they work in things to make the Sani taste the same everywhere, making you addicted to their specific brand. Also, according to the Sani nutrition label, magnesium sulfate, potassium chloride, and salts are added to the water, which some speculate is added in to purposely make you more thirsty, consuming more and more of the brand. Though, it can be argued that the amount added is too insignificant to do that. But what do you think? And do you like the taste of Dasani? Hebrew Temple Denial Temple denial is the assertion made by Palestinian politicians, religious leaders, thinkers, and writers that several temples in Jerusalem either didn't exist or were built somewhere else than the Temple Mount, a holy site in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam that has been around for thousands of years. The entire plaza is regarded as the noble sanctuary by Muslims, making it the third holiest place in Islam. Muslims believe it to be the location where Muhammad started his night journey. Roswell Incident The Roswell Incident involves the 1947 recovery of metallic and rubber wreckage from a crashed military balloon at Roswell, New Mexico. Decades later, conspiracy theories claim that the wreckage was from a flying saucer and that the truth had been suppressed by the United States government. Roswell Army Airfield published a press release on July 8, 1947, reporting that a quote-unquote flying disc had been retrieved. The Army quickly reversed their statements, though, claiming that the crashed object was a standard weather balloon and nothing more. The Roswell incident received little attention until the late 1970s when retired Lieutenant Colonel Jesse Marshall convinced UFOlogist Stanton Friedman that the debris he recovered was extraterrestrial, claiming that a spacecraft carrying aliens had crash-landed and that the military had recovered the aliens before taking part in a cover-up. Kanye West was cloned Ever since Kanye West was blacklisted from the music industry, many people believed that he was cloned or replaced, stating that ever since he went into hiding and then came out of hiding that he looked completely different and chose a different demeanor to portray to the media. Before that brief moment when he was completely missing from the public eye, he spoke about a lot of mysterious things. 
Kanye claimed that that Hollywood ritual sacrifice was a real thing, explaining that Bill Cosby, Michael Jordan, Dr. Dre all had family members that had to die in order for them to become super mega wealthy, even claiming that his own mother was also part of a ritual sacrifice in order for him to become wealthy. He explained that Hollywood execs were trying to traumatize him and traumatize others in the music industry. As a form of control, he even spoke up against uh, Balenciaga when other artists didn't want to speak up against them. This all led up to the conspiracy that he was kidnapped, secluded, and replaced by a clone or lookalike. All of this is speculated to have occurred to him because he was speaking up against Balenciaga and these other industries and their occult practices. Epstein's connections ignored. Okay, this is one that pisses me off in particular because people are getting off the hook for something horrible. Now, Jeffrey Epstein was of course caught and exposed for ex trafficking and other things that I can't speak about here on YouTube. Even coming to the mainstream after quote unquote conspiracy theorists had been covering him for a while. One interesting thing to note is that I even remember there being debunking videos made against these accusations. Where are they now? I don't know, as they seem to have been purged after a while, but I digress. The real question here is, why are so many people in close connection to Jeffrey Epstein and his island not being thoroughly investigated? Not only that, mainstream outlets seem to completely ignore his connections to high-ranking figures. Why isn't there more pressure on his associates? Well, some believe that his connections to those in the public eye make it so that it is impossible to bring this topic up without facing repercussions. But, put simply, it's speculated that he has dirt on every single person in the industry, a shadier side to the whole business, causing some to question how big and sophisticated his organization truly was in order to get away with doing those awful things on his weird island. How many people have been paid off to keep quiet and did his friends turn a blind eye to his criminal activities or were they participating? Clearly this isn't a political issue either as both the left and the right agree that there seems to be more than meets the eye. There's also the question of why wasn't he blacklisted sooner by companies and friends as he was a registered offender for a while, way before mainstream coverage. The victims even intended to sue Deutsche Bank and JP Morgan Chase for benefiting from their pain. According to the claims, the banks knowingly profited from Epstein's trafficking and opted for profits over following appropriate protocol and terminating his accounts. They just kept it. Like they did to this guy, it should apply to all vile criminals. He was convicted of soliciting prostitution from minors. What did you know about him when you were meeting with him, as you've said yourself, uh, in the hopes of raising money? I had dinners with him. Uh, I regret doing that. He had relationships with uh, people he said, you know, would give to Global Health, which is a uh, interest I have. You know, not nearly enough philanthropy goes in that direction. Uh, you know, those meetings, were, were a mistake. They didn't result in uh, what he purported and I cut them off. You know, that goes back a long time ago now. Uh, there's, you know, so there's nothing new on that. It was reported that you continue to meet with him over several years and that, in other words, a number of meetings. What did you do when you found out about his background? And, you know, I've said I regretted having those dinners uh, and there's nothing, absolutely nothing new on that. Is there a lesson for you for anyone else looking looking at this? Well, he's dead, so, uh, you know, in general, you always have to be careful, uh, and, you know, the... Humans are alien garbage. This title may seem ridiculous at first, but let me explain. A theory persists that we as human, the species, are a result of extraterrestrial trash. The aliens left their garbage here on Earth thousands of years ago, and we, the trash, eventually evolved to Homo sapiens, you know, modern day humans, hypothesized by Cornell University's very own Thomas Gold. We are simply cosmic garbage. The Amazon was built. You have probably heard of or have seen the Amazon rainforest in movies and TV shows, even inspiring Avatar, the highest grossing movie of all time, inspired by the Brazilian rainforest and the struggles of indigenous people who live there. The reason it is speculated of being man-made comes when comparing the Amazon to other natural woodlands. One major difference is that they normally stretch over large hills and mountains, but the rainforest doesn't, or at least not the majority. 
Most of it sits on top of flatland, almost looking like a massive garden. The people native to the area were also known to practice agriculture differently. Instead of planting small plants, they planted and harvested trees, taking the resources like the wood and the fruit from the tree, making the Amazon a massive rainforest city where the natives would take their resources from. It could be that it started off as a small area and grew out of hand after a while, ultimately creating the rainforest we now know. Immortal Celebrities Cult Okay, you've probably seen pictures like this, depicting a famous celebrity and on the side, an old black and white photo showing someone who looks exactly like them. Well, this entry suggests that all the celebrities in these eerie photos are somehow an occult that through some sort of science or occult ritual are able to live longer than the average human. That's or they're straight up immortal. Some also like to point out how most celebrities don't age, or at least they look younger than they actually are. How do they do this? Some say that the secret ingredient is adding kids slash young people's skin and other things into a remedy that could be applied to the face. Stem cells are rather popular in the cosmetic industry, however, they are usually taken from plants rather than kids slash young people. The theory behind the more recent use of foreskin fibroblasts in cosmetics is that they secrete significant amounts of human growth factor proteins, which stimulate cell regeneration and collagen formation making the skin appear younger. Tying this back to the immortal celebrity cult theory, some say that they are directly involved in a young people trafficking business, with the main purpose being to produce more fresh skin, used to keep the club looking young and fresh. Now, not everyone in Hollywood is accused of doing this, but some of the biggest stars are. Take a look. I've had stem cells in the blood of a two-year-old child injected into my skin and my face still looks like this. You need to be using fetus blood, Eddie, a little spritz of afterbirth, oh, darling. Yeah. And boost it, you look like a burn victim for a day, but then it's it, but then it pushes the What serum. are you pushing into the skin, Sarah? The serum. Sandra? Sarah? Well, you push in whatever the facialist would like to insert into your pores. But what is it? It is an extraction from a, um, a, a, uh... It's foreskin from a Korean baby. I... It's like, it's... <laughs> That's what it is. I, no. Media is meant for distraction. Put simply, media is a strong tool used to distract us from our daily lives that some suffer through due to endless jobs they work, pains they suffer, certain world events, and legal change brought upon the guise of being innovative and good, and or the realization that compels you to stand up against a government or company that is trying to suppress your rights and freedom. Basically, you are treated as a child so the grown-ups can deal with the real business, which is stealing from the poor and giving more to the rich. It's an old tale, history repeats itself, some other cliché, etc. Some would even say that American football is the modern equivalent to gladiators in ancient Rome. Meant for arenas of people. Entertaining, distracting, some players still get really hurt. An example could be the theory that puts forth the idea of Britney Spears being used by the Bush administration to distract the masses from the mistakes Bush was making at the White House. Some have stated that every time the White House would mess up, the press would come out with another scandalous story about Britney Spears. Oh, she almost dropped her baby? Really? Basically, she was the presidential scapegoat according to this theory. Elm Guesthouse Exaro coverage. Exaro was a British website situated in London. It ostensibly did political investigation journalism between 2011 and 2016, but it is now known together with its editor Mark Watts for its direct involvement in Nix Carl Beach's false allegations of abuse in Operation Midland. Exaro claimed to specialize and carry in depth investigations when it was founded in October 2011 and used the catchphrase holding power to account. Its website stated that it aimed to provide evidence-based open access journalism. Carl Beaches, under the alias Nick, claims that her powerful predator ring abused young people slash kids at Elm Guesthouse, a popular hotel where prominent British figures stayed in Barnes in the late 1970s. Beaches' allegations of abuse crimes committed by the supposed predator ring later became the basis for the Metropolitan Police's Operation Midland, a two million pound investigation that concluded in 2016 with no charges filed because there wasn't any evidence. Yep, the accused were the victims of false accusations. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner apologized to the victims of Beach. He was then convicted for his false claims and imprisoned for 18 years. Though some say that this was a cover-up, protecting the rich upper class, as Beach would go on to deny that he was in the wrong. An interesting thing to know is that Beach was then convicted of similar charges that he was pursuing. So was he actually projecting or was he blackmailed? Albinism Hunters 
This is in reference to the practice of the hunting of people with albinism in some parts of sub-Saharan Africa. According to the theory, certain albinistic people and their body parts can transmit magical abilities. Such superstitions is widespread, particularly in some parts of Africa's Great Lakes region, and has been promoted and exploited by witch doctors and others who use their body parts and ingredients and rituals and potions, claiming that their magic will bring the user prosperity. And of course, the victims can't do anything to change as it is a genetically inherited condition. As a result, even graves have been dug up to be used in these practices. Politics influence science. This entry explains itself, and some cases have been proven to be true. It is when a government, business, or any other organization uses its power and wealth to influence the findings of scientific research in order to benefit from it, leaving a negative impact on the academic validity of certain fields and scientific freedoms. For example, according to documents from the U.S. State Department, the Bush administration commended Exxon executives for their active involvement in crafting climate change policies. Yes, the same Exxon company that now has to pay pay $14 million fines over creating air pollution at its Baytown, Texas crude oil refinery, the biggest fine ever imposed in a citizen enforcement action related to air pollution, according to the plaintiff's attorneys. Get this, 124 organizations have been receiving funding from ExxonMobil or have collaborated closely with those that have, according to the information found in official Exxon documents. According to The Guardian columnist George Monbiot, these organizations take a consistent line on climate change, that the science is contradictory, the scientists are split, environmentalists are charlatans, liars, or lunatics, and if governments took action to prevent global warming, they would be endangering the environment. By the middle of the 1950s, scientists had come to the conclusion that smoking increases the risk of developing lung cancer, but the tobacco industry resisted the findings both in the media and among scientists. Tobacco firms supported think tanks and lobbying organizations, launched public health initiatives, placed ads in medical publications, and even investigated other potential causes of lung cancer, such as pollution, asbestos, and even pit birds. So I guess we can thank them for those. They advocate for more research to be done though, while denying all the evidence against tobacco in an effort to delay regulations. All this to say that who's to know whether this is going on right now and in the other fields. Toxic Fake Food This entry references the additives and other harmful ingredients that are in human food in order to produce large quantities of it, at a cheaper price, or because it simply makes the food more addictive and delicious. This of course is detrimental to our health, but ultimately big food companies value profit more than morals, you know, doing the right thing for the greater good. Take for example what the pizza chain Domino's is doing in India, a developing nation they offer a once considered quality fast food product at a cheaper rate of only under one American dollar. I mean, some things on the menu are only a few cents. Allegedly, a former Domino's chef consultant even came out revealing that they use fake cheese, instead using a super creamy sauce that mimics the consistency of natural melted cheese, as seen in the documentary Global Junk Food. They even sent off the Domino's cheese to be tested in a lab, finding no traces of cheese whatsoever in the contraption, but rather tons of oils and saturated fats. And do they get away with it? Yes, due to the fact that they aren't legally obligated to provide nutritional facts to the people of India. In China, some street vendors and restaurants who are struggling to get by purchase recycled gutter oil to cook with, as it is a way to make the food more affordable, though they contain bacteria, heavy metals, and pesticides, which are known to be carcinogenic. Processing and reheating the oil is also known to release cancer-causing substances, including some of the most poisonous carcinogens. During the Beijing Winter Olympics, athletes were warned of consuming Chinese meats by several agencies, as they feared the meats contained certain drugs that could disqualify them for the games, specifically Klambutra, an agent banned to use in meat productions in the US. Humans don't have free will. According to this theory, a person's every move is predetermined. Humans do not have free will. They were given their fates by the powers that be. Some believe that we live in a simulation where all the actions an individual takes is simply according to their programming, where hypothetically all NPCs, nobody's the main character. 
our past, present, and futures are already defined according to this theory. Now, some argue that a certain version of quantum mechanics allows for this to happen. All the states of the quantum universe exist at the same time. Multiple scenarios occur without us realizing it. This is known as the many worlds interpretation. Randomness is only believed to exist because we simply experience one reality at a time. Drake put a hit on XXX Tentacion. Going viral again on TikTok, this theory isn't new and it had been circulating for a while before blowing up again in 2023. Of course, this had to do with the tragic passing of XXX Tentacion in Florida. Assassinated while in his car, soon after his death, people online began pointing fingers, accusing certain rivals he had in the industry for being responsible for the hit. The person who came up the most in the conversation was Drake, accused of sneak dissing X even after his death, stating on the song on BS if he held his tongue and that live he'd be alive again the strange thing that really held up this theory for many years was the fact that x himself said that if he were ever taken out drake was the person behind it not only that he claimed that people were trying to sacrifice him including drake claiming that he was trying to steal his flow and music style. These accusations supposedly angered Drake, enough to put a head out for him. Drake's involvement almost made it to the trial when the defense attorney, Marcelio Padilla, believed that Aubrey needed to face deposition, though Drake's lawyer challenged doing any sort of deposition because he was nowhere near the scene of the crime, and there is no concrete evidence of Aubrey's involvement whatsoever, though many argue that he simply had others do the dirty work for him. You know mob ties, leaving him clean with no traces leading back to him. The judge ultimately refused to bring Drake into X's trial though. Mobs control China When you think about it, you don't often see Western news outlets cover Asian mobs and their crimes. Known as the Chinese Triad Mafia, the gang's origin can be traced back to the 17th century. Unlike other organized crime groups that predominantly focus on certain ventures, the Triad is involved in various sectors including government and business, ranking themselves according to numeric codes based on Chinese numerology, indicating a person's level in the gang. Some believe that these family-controlled groups have infiltrated major parts of the the Chinese government, giving them free reign to do whatever they want in China. Some say that this is why human abductions are common in China and why they almost always go unsolved. In one report, it stated that 2,739 people went missing every day in China in the year 2020. That's close to 1 million people completely vanishing in the year. Those are also considered low numbers compared to past stats. As in 2016, the number of missing persons was 3.94 million. In one case, a woman who found out that she had been abducted abducted as a child came forward, trying to find her origin and ultimately her real family, describing what she could remember about her childhood before being kidnapped. Some say that these mafias are getting so powerful that they are also infiltrating cartels in Mexico, a country known for having ruthless drug cartels. They work together in efforts to smuggle product into the United States more efficiently. Iraq Hidden Stargates The Mesopotamian region consisting of Iraq and other countries is the home of the ancient Sumerians who worshipped deities known as the Anunnaki. Theorized to be an ancient alien civilization who brought knowledge to human beings on Earth, the Sumerians believed that they lived in the heavens above. This area is often described as the cradle of civilization for the old world at the time, as they were some of the first to develop a form of writing and agriculture, leading to powerful ancient cities. A modern theory proposes that these godlike entities, known as the Anunnaki, give the Sumerians the technology and knowledge to push humanity forward, creating a stargate or portal of sorts that allowed for communication between the Anunnaki aliens and the humans. These portals were kept secret and were always well guarded throughout history in order to maintain civility on Earth. America, a modern world superpower, wanted complete access to these stargates, so the theory is that they purposely started the Iraq war, giving them a reason to enter the country and steal the ancient technologies in the region. This is also theorized to be the main reason why other powerful countries wanted to control this area. LASIK Big Pharma Rabbit Hole Many are unaware of the dangers of getting LASIK eye surgery, a procedure done to correct vision allowing people to not have to wear glasses or contacts. They basically shoot a laser into each of your eyeballs and it's supposed to change the shape of the cornea by sanding it down with the laser so you can see in HD. It sounds painful but for many people it heals quickly and it dramatically changes their life for the positive. But this isn't the case for everyone who undergoes the procedure. For one college kid it ultimately led to depression and he would go on 
on to an alive because the pain and vision loss due to the surgery was so intense it wouldn't go away. We know all this because of his final letter detailing his pain and suffering that came as a result of the surgery. His dry eyes were so bad that he put on eye drops every 5 minutes. This isn't the only case of something like this happening either. Another case details a father who was required to wear glasses for his police officer position. Not wanting to wear them, he opted for LASIK eye surgery instead, but his recovery didn't go as planned. He constantly suffered from dry eye, making his eyes very sensitive, causing a great burning sensation. His son noticed that he was beginning to see signs of depression in his father, as he sometimes wouldn't want to get out of bed in the morning due to his eye problems. Sadly, one day, his father didn't come home at the time that he was expecting. He later found out that his father had unalived himself in his cruiser with his issued service weapon at 54 years old. His final letter stated in all caps, do not have LASIK surgery, tell the media. One guy even suffered the pain for six years until he finally decided it was enough. His father would go on to advocate for him. Um, I'm here to tell the story of my son, Colin. Uh, before Colin had LASIK surgery, he was a very confident, outgoing person. There was no sign of any mental illness. He'd never been diagnosed with mental illness. As you can see, he wasn't much more than a child. I think the thing that best explains where Colin was is to read the last words he left for us. At the time of this writing, I've lived for six and a half years like this, and it drives me more and more crazy every single day. For a while, I coped fairly well and have gone forward with things I had to do. But this problem has kept me from enjoying life the way I used to. There is also the popular meteorologist who unalived after reporting permanent eye issues due to getting LASIK. She was married with two children. Even a former FDA advisor who voted to approve LASIK surgery said he regrets it and is now an advocate against the procedure, as he believes the lifelong risks outweigh the benefits for most. Some believe that the risks aren't highlighted enough, to the point that it seems professionals are ignoring the evidence and prioritizing the profitable industry, even though 10 to 30 percent of those who get the procedure done suffer a variety of complications in their eyesight afterwards. According to LASIK surgeons themselves, they have a 96% satisfaction rate, which is kind of amazing, as this means 4 out of 100 people are not pleased with the results after getting this procedure done on one of the most sensitive parts of the body. Coke changed. According to one theory, the Coca-Cola company purposely changed the formula of Coca-Cola to one that was inferior in order to either increase demand for the original product or allow for the reintroduction of the original original with the new formula made with less expensive ingredients, either due to inflation or simply greed. However, Coca-Cola president at the time, Donald Coe, had a response, stating, the truth is, we're not that dumb and we're not that smart. This all came after the invention of New Coke, which was launched in 1985 by the company, due to them believing that the drink was falling out of popularity after a decline in sales, though some think that this was an excuse to switch to a cheaper formula that would ultimately be detrimental to our health. New Coke ended up flopping, regular customers preferred the old recipe that they completely replaced and it went back to the original coke. At straight away. This entry is in reference to Twitter user Straight Away, who posted a video online showcasing a strange voicemail message he got with no caller ID. These words aren't random either. If you decipher it using the NATO phonetic alphabet, it translates to danger, SOS, it is dire for you to evacuate, be cautious, they are not human. It sounds like something out of a movie, right? In the video, the robot's voice also reads a series of numbers, which if they plugged into Google Maps at the time, they got coordinates close to a specific part of Malaysia, where a plane vanished. Some began to make connections and concluded that it had to be coming from Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, an international passenger flight that disappeared on March 8, 2014 without a trace. The last recorded words from the cockpit were Good Night Malaysian 370, involving a whole other conspiracy too. That puts forth the idea that you could hear a faint scream or something strange in the background at the end of that recording. Take a listen. Malaysian 370. Malaysian 370, contact Ho Chi Minh 120 decimal 9. Good night. Good night, Malaysian 370. The dude that allegedly got this voicemail also started to receive unsettling messages telling him to remove the post off his account. Guy even got messages in Morse code, which some translated to, they are taking over. Shane Dawson even interviewed the man in the video, mind-blowing conspiracy theories, where the guy swears he didn't fake the voicemail. 
Gateway Experience. Guess who's behind this one? That's right, the good old CIA, a government agency that has no record whatsoever of being involved in shady things like JFK or the straight up fact that they spy on literally everyone through their phones and laptops and were exposed for doing so by their own member. This entry is a little bit more interesting than that though. Analysis and assessment of gateway process is a declassified document report containing information about a training system designed to enhance one's focus and coherence by somehow changing our brainwaves outputs on both our left and right hemispheres using the power of sound to do so. This would alter consciousness in the human body, allowing us to access the non-physical elements of life, a different reality of sorts. Declassified by the CIA in 2003, but originally published in 1983, the report even states that healing our own bodies and manifesting goals are practical uses of this training system, as they describe it. You could also access these brain-enhancing benefits through transcendental meditation and hypnosis, supposedly, as they parallel the outcomes. Something called biofeedback also caught my eye, as I had never heard of the practice before. Let me read this interesting passage from the report. It explains the technique and its benefits. The third consciousness altering methodology which will be briefly described is biofeedback. Biofeedback is somewhat unique in that it actually employs the self-cognitive powers of the left hemisphere to gain access to such areas of the right brain as the lower cerebral motor and sensor cortices and assorted pain or pleasure centers. Instead of suppressing the left hemisphere as is done in hypnosis or largely bypassing and ignoring it as is done in transcendental meditation, biofeedback teaches the left hemisphere first to visualize the desired result and then to recognize the feelings associated with the experience of successful right hemisphere access to the specific lower cerebral cortex pain or pleasure or other areas in the manner needed to produce the desired result. Wow, that's hard to digest. Here's an example. If the subject wishes to increase the circulation in the left leg in order to speed up healing, he may concentrate with his left brain on achieving that result while carefully monitoring a digital thermometer connected to the left leg. When the concentrated efforts begin to achieve success, the digital thermometer will register an increase in the temperature of the left leg. At that point, the subject can mentally left brain associate the sensations experienced with the results achieved and can begin to emphasize by memory recall the same process to cause its strength by affirmation and repetition. Using this technique, pain can be blocked, healing can be enhanced, malignant tumors can apparently be suppressed and ultimately destroyed, the body's pleasure centers can be stimulated once again, and a variety of specific physiological results can be achieved, according to this paper. The mysteries behind language. There are tons of strange facts about human language. For example, they did a study in which students were taught a language at an early age at an accelerated pace. MRIs showed that parts of their brains began to grow due to the fact that they were learning a new language. The other group, the control group, were learning something completely different and showed no brain growth whatsoever. People who have learned a second language at an early age have also been shown to have better cognitive function at older ages, even delaying the effects of Alzheimer's altogether in some individuals. You can even talk to your DNA according to some people. A theory persists that words can have an effect on one's DNA and change our body's energy. Mantra. This is described as a sacred chant of a word or words containing an important meaning in order to have some sort of effect on yourself or others. There is convincing evidence that using mantras can in fact help people manage their hypertension by reducing their blood pressure and reducing stress. All this to say that words do in fact have power over human beings. Katy Perry MK Ultra. This entry derives from a video that went viral depicting famous singer Katy Perry having some sort of episode on stage after performing. Her face goes blank as she stares off into the distance and her eyes begin to twitch. The top comment even stated, almost seemed like she had to push a button to open her eyes on the side of her face. Some believe that she is under some sort of mind control by elite Hollywood handlers in order to fulfill a certain contract. Others legitimately believe that she is a clone. Supposedly, clones are made in case the artist passes before paying back the loans given to them by music labels. For all we know, it could be something like the sunken place from Jordan Peele's Get Out. Purple Sphere Freakout 
let's say you're walking through the desert for any particular reason, and you come across thousands of purple jelly-like spheres scattered in a single area. Would you be astonished and call the local news, or would you just conclude that it's some sort of weird trending product, like Orbeez that someone left there? Well, apparently, not many people know or I guess knew about water beads back in 2013, leading to an entire news segment touching on a woman who found, like many stated, alien-like eggs in the barren desert. Some theories even suggested it was a new fungal type organism. Others wrote it off as strange, but a natural phenomenon. Litter Boxes and Schools Origin There was a popular rumor going around that claimed schools in the United States and Canada were providing litter boxes in public school bathrooms for teens who identified as cats, furries, or any other subculture. Though perpetuated in the media, it turned out to be completely fake. As every school that was mentioned in popular news articles about the rumor denied the accusation that they ever did such a thing. Many prominent figures claimed that this was true and used the false rumor to start a frenzy. Among Joe Rogan listeners? Yeah, he brought it up once freaking out about it, but later admitted that there was no proof this was true. No, kitty litter was not offered in public schools, but that begs the question, who started this rumor? And why did the media eat it up so fast? Pearl Harbor was not a surprise. This theory states that the Pearl Harbor attack by Japan was purposely allowed to occur by the US military. Some claim that certain military officials knew about the plan, but rather than trying to prepare for the attack, they let the events unfold. The most popular version of this theory states that Franklin D. Roosevelt, the US president at the time, decided to allow the attack and use it as an excuse to enter the United States into the Second World War as Congress and most American civilians were strongly opposed to joining the conflict. They needed an excuse to push it forward. Here's a fact. 10 hours before the events, the US intercepted Japanese radio messages that detected Japanese fleets heading very close to Hawaii, something that was considered alarming, yet nobody warned commanders in Hawaii to send ships and air patrols to investigate the matter. It's said that Admiral Hart of the United States Navy even knew about the attacks and that they would occur sometime around December 7th. US Marines were even evacuated from China days before. They were set up in the Philippines in order to prepare for the war. Straw Man Legal Argument The Straw Man This is a legal term used by many sovereign citizens. They believe that a person has two identities under the law, one as a flesh and blood human being and the other being a separate entity, the straw man, that is supposed to represent you and that's all legal responsibilities apply to that entity, but not directly to you as the flesh and blood person. Therefore, they conclude that they do not have to follow certain or all governmental laws. So you first need to go through a process which legally separates you from your straw man, according to them, involving doing something with your social security number and birth certificate. It changes according to the person. But after that, you're legally free to do anything you want, according to them, I guess. For example, some people believe that taxes and other debts only apply to the straw man and argue that them as the person should be absolved of any financial burdens. US courts usually reject these arguments though and acknowledge them as simply being scams and the IRS has fined people for trying to do this. Though many continue to believe that this is a viable legal proceeding, there are many videos of people getting into trouble when trying this in court. Spanish conquistadors altered history. When you think of the Aztecs or Mayans, what do you think of? Does their practice of human sacrifice come into mind? Well, some believe that the Spanish conquistadors and priests, in order to dehumanize the indigenous population of Mesoamerica, would exaggerate the amount of human sacrifices that took place and lie about their reasonings behind it, simply explaining them away as savage humans that kill their own people for no reason causing some to question the numbers of sacrificed individuals as reported by the Spanish. Post-conquest sources report that as many as 80,000 plus prisoners were sacrificed over the span of four days at the reconsecration of the Great Pyramid of Tenochtitlan in 1487. That's about 15 or less sacrifices per minute. Historians now believe that these accounts were exaggerated in order to justify Spain's brutal conquest of the region. The Aztecs were also known for their use of propaganda in order to spread their political power. This would include inflating the number of enemies that were sacrificed to intimidate rivals. Missionaries at the time who actually interviewed the Aztecs themselves put the figure at around 4,000 prisoners for the Great Reconsecration. 
get this, only 603 of the skulls found at the site have ever been found associated with Aztec human sacrifices as of the year 2020, which says a lot about these massive numbers. It's now understood that only high status prisoners of war were typically sacrificed, with lower status prisoners mainly being used as slave labor. They also burned the Mayan manuscripts with years of history and information, claiming it was pagan, forcing everyone in the region to convert to Catholicism. Here's a fun fact, 5,000 Mayan artifacts were set on fire and lit to burn in 1562. These were a collection of books and wooden figures. The Mayan codices, aka books, made of bark paper, contain historical accounts, astronomical observations, and even religious instructions for Maya priest. Diego de Landa, a Spanish priest, the guy that led this movement, couldn't even decipher the texts, but said that he knew he had to burn them because they supposedly contained lies from the devil. The guy even looks like a hater, what a bozo. It's still unknown what these books contained and how much ancient knowledge was lost due to his actions. Many times, mine people were burned at the stake and tortured in various ways that I can't describe here because of guidelines, but Diego took it a step further and decided that erasing their history was more impactful in the long run, as Mayans wouldn't be able to reconnect with their roots by reading the codices again. This was also done at a time when the people of the region were deciding to overthrow the Christian authorities and once again establish their own customs. So it was also a power move on behalf of Diego to burn the books. This one really pisses me off as my family is from Oaxaca, Mexico, specifically from the Mixtec region, where we speak our own native language still. It's crazy to read how much history was erased for the sake of disconnecting us from our ancestors and their achievements though. Oil imperialism. This theory asserts that the control of the world's oil reserves is the main reason why we globally enter into many wars and altercations, and this is generally agreed upon somewhat by many economists and historians that since World War I, it has always been a leading asset that many countries have strived to control. Many suggest that the Gulf War, the 2003 invasion of Iraq, and other altercations in the Middle East that the US has been involved with were initiated to collect all the rich oil resources in the area, explaining why the US is the leading producer of oil and is also the country who spends the most on their military, explains a lot. Dolphin Interactions, Regulations, and Policies a lot of people don't know, but you could get into a lot of trouble for trying to communicate with wild dolphins. And the theories as to why they don't want us interacting with dolphins are interesting. Dolphins are known to be very smart and sentient creatures. They are even known to recognize themselves in a mirror, something that a lot of other animals can't do. They even look inside of their own mouths, something that I do on the daily. It goes to show how another animal could actually use a mirror as a tool. Now back to why we can't speak to them and why it's illegal. In the video Human Dolphin Telepathy with Christian Dickensy, he states that dolphins could speak to humans telepathically. He recounts meeting a female dolphin in a tank alone. This dolphin was depressed and sad and its name was Dondi and he was able to communicate with it telepathically and instruct it to do tricks and whatnot. This PhD guy, he was able to communicate with this dolphin through telepathy and was able to capture it all on camera. Of course, they already knew what tricks to do, but according to him, this was proof that they could in fact communicate with dolphins in this mysterious way. And these aren't the only people that believe that they could communicate with dolphins or other sea creatures through telepathy. Other groups exist as well that believe in this too. Ultimately, believing that all dolphins in the world could communicate with each other telepathically. And that this is a secret kept from the general public. Why? Well, because supposedly they don't want us knowing about the true sentience of these creatures and many other like them. Fearing that we'll eventually discover this and put a stop to polluting the sea and destroying their homes, which would be a huge detriment to large corporations that basically profit off of pollution. Atacama Skeleton the 6 inch long 16 centimeter skeleton remains of a humanoid were discovered in 2003 in a Chilean village in the Atacama Desert. They were given the name Atta. The remains were later tested via DNA analysis, finding that the humanoid had unusual genetic mutations most often associated with dwarfism and scoliosis, though these findings were heavily disputed for a while. 
researchers opposed to this claim suggested that the skeleton remains show signs of a normal looking fetus in development, the only difference being that it wasn't human. It even made an appearance in the 2013 UFO film Sirius, in which they speculate that the skeletal remains are that of extraterrestrial origin. This caused such an uproar that Stanford University geneticist Gary P. Nolan contacted the film's production team and got a hold of the skeleton, concluding that the remains are human. Anatomist and paleoanthropologist William Jungers hypothesized that it was a human embryo that was born prematurely and perished before or soon after birth because of the open frontal suture of the skull and the incomplete ossification of the hands and feet. Although pediatric radiologist Ralph Lackman has stated that dwarfism alone could not have accounted for all the traits identified in the embryo. Nolan's alternative theory is that Ada had a combination of genetic problems that caused the infant to be aborted before term, giving the remains a distinct look. Researchers ultimately found 64 unusual mutations in the seven total genes linked to the skeleton, something they had never seen before. Keep in mind, these mutations have yet to be explored and studied as they were new to the researchers. Spanish Conquest of America Lie When thinking of the Spanish Conquest of the Americas, you most likely see it as a mass genocide, with the Spanish being the evil invaders who spread disease and took the land. But it wasn't a clear-cut story as it's often referred to. Just like any civilization, there were already major conflicts and other complex issues occurring in the Mesoamerican region, involving war and leaders with power trips. So much so that the Tlaxcala people who were being surrounded by the Aztecs, the Mexica, decided to ally with the Spanish, of course after a brief battle with them, but ultimately supplying them with resources like food, fresh water, routes, and men to defeat and take down the powerful Aztec Empire, the Mexica Empire. Now let me get into the details. There were only about 600 Spanish men who arrived to take over the Mexica, with a few horses. Most of the army used to take over the Mexica Empire actually consisted of the tens of thousands of Tlaxcala allies and other neighboring indigenous groups who had similar motives. Meaning without the Tlaxcala people, Cortes would most likely not have been able to conquer the Mexica, as they were greatly outnumbered. It was actually recorded that heading west, Cortes and his men would come across natives of the area who would tell stories of the cruel treatment at the hands of the Mexica, the Aztecs. They knew that an alliance would benefit them both. After winning, the Tlaxcala were given what they were promised, rule over their own government and lands, and they were not forced to pay taxes, as long as they converted to Catholicism though. Thriller Album Cover Changed this is in reference to the pretty famous Thriller album cover by Michael Jackson, where he's leaning on the ground. Apparently, many people recall him simply wearing a black button-down shirt, with white or black buttons. But if you look at the album cover now, he is sporting a casual black zip-up hoodie. I guess this made its way onto TikTok, where people are arguing whether or not this is a Mandela effect. I don't have a preference for either one, but what do you guys remember him wearing on this iconic album cover? Solipsism have you ever thought that maybe this is all a dream? That you are the only real person in your universe and that everyone else is an NPC? A construction of your own creative mind? Maybe our own perception is deceiving us into believing what we see exists outside of ourselves, outside of our brains. But in reality, nothing truly exists outside of one's own perception. Solipsism is the philosophical theory that the self, you as a single person, the individual, are the only thing that can be trusted as real and truly existing, believing that even other human beings are illusions created by our inner consciousness. René Descartes, a French philosopher, arrives at only a single first principle, that he thinks. This is expressed in Latin phrase cogito ergo sum, the English translation being, I think, therefore I am. Descartes concluded, if he doubted, then something or someone must be doing the doubting. Therefore, the very fact that he doubted proved his existence. The simple meaning of the phrase is that if one is skeptical of existence, that is in and of itself proof that he does exist. I like how the simple idea of just thinking proves that we exist, but cannot prove that other things around us are real or are manifestations in different forms. This kind of thinking I believe is rather dangerous though as it has led some down paths of alienation from those around them and could lead to the loss of empathy, 
What does your mother or father, family and friends truly mean if nothing were real and everything was a figment of your imagination? It would eventually drive someone crazy. Inca Skull Surgery When I think of the words ancient surgery, I usually think of the early days. You know, the 1800s type shit. When they had surgery theaters in which they would perform the surgery in front of other people and the doctors wore suits. I highly recommend the television show The Nick. It depicts the early history of Western surgery practices and really showcases how far medicine has advanced. But the 1800s wasn't the first time major successful surgeries were completed. Apparently, we can trace this practice all the way back to the ancient Peruvians. When digging up ancient Peruvian graves, archaeologists started to notice that there were openings in the skulls of many individuals. These ancient skulls revealed that the holes were deliberately made when the person was still alive and showed that they lived well after the surgery was performed. They would go on to find the instruments used to perform these surgeries as well, like the tumi, a bronze sharp knife used to make an opening in the skull, and other objects to probe inside, known as trepanation. The act was most likely part of a ritual. In 2018, a study came out showcasing the remarkable feats they achieved in surgery, as there was a 75 to 83 percent survival rate for those who had surgery during the Inca Empire, according to research conducted by the World Neurosurgery Journal. Those percentages even spiked higher to 91 percent when additional skull samples were found from the same time period outperforming the 50% survival rates of trepanation surgeries during the Civil War era in the United States, some 400 years later, which consisted of very similar methods. Civil War medical records revealed that 46% of patients would die due to cranial surgery, as opposed to the Inca who had a 17% fatality rate. This of course isn't a dig at Civil War doctors, as they probably had to deal with bullet wounds and other objects lodged in heads, but it's more of a highlight of the ancient Incas' strange amount of knowledge on brain surgery, which ties into the whole hidden or lost knowledge theory, which implies ancient civilizations were far more advanced than we give them credit for. The Adam and Eve Story this entry is in reference to Dr. Chan Thomas's The Adam and Eve Story, in which he details how humanity might become extinct due to the shift of Earth's magnetic poles, which according to the book, occurs every 6,500 years, as part of a cycle. The planet will allegedly flip and be at a standstill, causing havoc on Earth. Released in 1966, it was quickly classified by the CIA before anyone could read it. That is, until the year 2013, when it was declassified but only 57 pages worth out of the 284 total pages. The rest were scrubbed, or as they put it in the page description, sanitized for release. In the book, he presents evidence of why a shift is coming to the Earth's poles. Basically, this cycle has always occurred on Earth according to the book, resetting human civilization every time, claiming that we are only the sixth advanced civilization to be on planet Earth. Though this concept isn't only unique to him and his book, the study of Earth's poles and theories about them shifting predate his report. His unique claim is that it all occurs within a single day, unlike other theories that suggest it takes a long period of time. It all supposedly starts with a massive earthquake, unlike anyone has ever experienced before. This shaking on Earth then causes great tsunamis that overtake cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco. The wind surges inland will cause great destruction and sweep people off their feet in a matter of seconds due to Earth's air and water continuing to spin as the planet comes to a stop. One side of the planet will see a massive rise in temperature as the sun directly faces it, while the other side will see a new ice age. All of these events will span for six days. On the sixth day, it will finally calm down and things will begin to settle as the new poles are established. Greenland and Antarctica will no longer be under ice. Instead, the tropical will now flourish in these places. Though, those who survive will need to start from scratch, and that's what he believes has already occurred to past civilizations. And this is a controversial idea, of course, as it supports the global flood theory supported by stories from ancient civilizations who claimed that there was a massive flood in their area, like the Mayans, the Chinese, and the Mesopotamians, which had the Epic of Gilgamesh, basically the original Noah's Ark story. Fiction or not, they recount similar stories. eBay Stalkers You often hear people claiming that they are being gang stalked or followed by a specific group, like the CIA, FBI, or NSA. I come across a lot of people like this on my For You page on TikTok. 
most of the time it ends up being more of a mental health issue than anything else as there is often little to no evidence of the frantic person being the target of stalking by a major organization. This is where eBay, the Silicon Valley giant, comes into play. A well-established online company, you would think that they would be more sane than to target individuals who criticize them. But that is exactly what they did to a couple who ran a news site about e-commerce. Prominent employees at eBay tried to slowly ruin their lives. They were a target of harassment and stalking. E-commerce Bytes, a news website all about the e-commerce industry ran by Ina and David Steiner, it reports events in the sector, like eBay, Etsy, or Amazon issues, updates, and more that affect both the user and the sellers. They were slowly gaining popularity, attracting even the Wall Street investors, executives, and other industry observers who asked for their insights. On August 8, 2019, something strange occurred. The Steiners began receiving strange newsletters they never signed up for coming from sources like The Satanic Temple, Heather's IBS News, Infowars, Vancouver Fetish Weekend, and more. Also receiving threatening messages via Twitter, claiming that they would show up to the Steiner's home to teach them a lesson. They even tried to deliver a pig fetus to their home address, only for the company to contact the Steiner's, telling them that they couldn't fulfill the order. Later, they would receive a pig mask at their front door. David even received a book titled How to Survive the Loss of a Spouse, and a few days later, they received an expensive funeral wreath. He also began to notice cars following him around the city, and even got a snapshot of one of the license plates, which led to them discovering that it was a rental car, and with that, got the info on the renter. It was an eBay employee named Veronica Zia. They even caught her on a grocery store security camera, buying a gift card to purchase the funeral wreath delivered to the Steiners. Ultimately, the FBI took over the investigation. The crazy thing is, is that even the CCO and the official CEO of eBay in 2019 were all part of this, encouraging them to quote unquote, take her down, as stated by the CEO of eBay at the time, Devin Winnig. The CCO, Steve Weimer, even said he wanted to see ashes no matter the consequence. eBay as the company was not charged with any crimes, only certain employees were ever charged but the CEO and CCO got away scot-free. The only question that remains is what other companies are out there doing this? Where did they get their inspiration from? Quantum Immortality You will live forever no matter what, who you are, or your circumstances. Even living past the age of 100 years old, crippled and in a wheelchair, stuck on a ventilator, you will keep on living forever. There is no end. Well, that's if quantum immortality is true. According to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, a quantum particle exists as simultaneously in each of its potential states, rather than just one. To collapse the wave function and reveal the state's actuality, observation is required. Let's get small. Let's get really freaking small, immensely small, like to the point where we can see atoms. These subatomic particles don't follow the same exact rules as say for instance a bigger object like a Lego piece or a Nintendo Switch controller follow. Like if we step on this, we know what's going to happen. It's going to hurt, right? Its identity is being a Lego, a brick with studs on top of it, ready to connect or be connected with another piece to make a greater object. In this case, Paris, France. An electron found in all atoms can be identified by its four quantum numbers that are specifically unique to it. Now, one of these, the fourth number, is called the electron spin quantum number. Electrons can have positive spins and negative spins, but just keep in mind, they don't actually literally spin like a ball. It's in a superposition, allowing it to spin positively and negatively at the same time. Which can be confusing when you're trying to do this with an object in our perception of reality, where things are big. This is known as classical mechanics. Take the kitty in the box thought experiment in which you put a helpless cat in a box alongside a TNT with the 50% chance it'll go off in the next 30 seconds. Before you open the box again to reveal the results, you can say that the cat is alive and dead at the same time. It's in a superposition until you observe it, only to find out that the cat most likely died. 2. Many realities existing. It seems unnatural but all natural at the same time. The many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, on the other hand, proposes that as soon as you've made your final decision and take action, the universe splits into two realities, 
One, in which you decided to not wear a seatbelt on that car ride that led to your death because you crashed, and the other in which you buckled up and survived, but the only one that you've experienced is the one in which you've always been buckled up and survived that crash, due to the fact that you only know what it's like to be alive and cannot perceive any other reality in which you died. Your reality continues on as normal. Always. That is your perspective. Though it's not everyone else's perspective. And that's where it gets dark. Your loved ones are still mourning your death and the other reality in which you perished. But just like you, each individual lives forever in their reality from their perspective. But how do you test this? I guess the only real way to prove if this theory is true is to get in a box alongside the cat and wait until the 30 seconds have passed. Keep on doing that until the statistical chances of the TNT not going off become impossible. And that's how you find out if you're immortal or not. Due to the fact that if this theory were true, every time you get in the death box after 30 seconds, you simply poof, split off into another branch of reality in which you live. No matter how many times you get into that box, you won't die, though the risk outweighs the benefits by a lot. I'm personally not that curious to find out. Cornerstone Ritual at White House A lot of people don't know that the secret society known as the Freemasons were at the inception of the United States, even helping to create the White House. Before starting on the build of the White House, they had to do the Cornerstone Ritual which involves laying down the first stone used to create the house and pouring corn, wine, and oil on top of it. The corn was for nourishment, the wine for refreshment, and the oil represented joy. Objects are speculated to have been placed within the stone as well, working as a time capsule, a tradition they carried on when building other monuments and important buildings. This group of masons was supposedly overseen by George Washington himself, who was a high-ranking mason at the time. Strangely enough, he didn't end up living inside of the mansion, although he planned the building and got it approved by Congress. Now, you may be asking, what was found inside of the stone? Well, sadly, we'll never know, as it was lost or, I guess, mixed in the shuffle of the other stones, and or misplaced somewhere else, and has never been found since. Some believe that it contains different versions of the Constitution that detail what America could have potentially been like, elaborate instructions for Freemasons in the future, etc due to the fact that there were founding fathers with different opinions over how the constitution was written. Something interesting to know is that President Harry Truman gutted tons of the kind of original White House in the 1950s, looking for the stone, when they were forced to renovate the building. A thorough investigation was conducted. They found tons of stones with Masonic signs on them, but never the actual cornerstone. All of these Masonic-related stones were sent to active Freemason Grand Lodges under the direction of Harry Truman, who was a mason himself. Love and Death, 2004 book. The book Love and Death, The Murder of Kurt Cobain, co-written by Ian Halpern and Max Wallace, claims to demonstrate that Kurt Cobain, the lead guitarist and singer of Nirvana, was murdered instead of committing suicide, possibly at the request of his wife, Courtney Love. It is a sequel to the writer's best-selling book on the same topic from 1998, Who Killed Kurt Cobain? The book is based on 30 hours of audio taped conversations between Courtney Love's private investigator, Tom Grant, and her and Cobain's entertainment lawyer, Rosemary Carroll, who both disagree with the official determination of suicide and think Cobain was actually murdered. These conversations were obtained exclusively by the authors. On the tapes, Rosemary Carroll states that she thinks the suicide note was forged or traced. The author also speaks with Courtney Cobain's father, who also thinks Kurt was murdered, and Kurt Cobain's grandpa, who believes Kurt was a victim of foul play. In the book, a well-known forensic pathologist looks at the autopsy data and declares that the official suicide theory was quote-unquote impossible. She asserts that there is convincing and reliable proof that Cobain was killed. $2.3 trillion missing the year is 2001. The defense secretary at the time was Donald Rumsfeld. He would go on live television in front of millions of people to host a press conference on military spending to report that $2.3 trillion were not able to be tracked and went missing according to their transactions, which is the same amount as the entire US federal budget was at the time. A whole year's worth of cash was simply gone, just like that. An interesting thing to note is that the day after, America will face the biggest terrorist attack ever to occur on U.S. land on September 11th, 2001. 
This of course caused a major switch in attention. Instead of focusing on the massive financial hole in the military's budget, people began to fear their safety, ultimately leading to more coverage and outcry to take action against the terrorist events. These unaccounted funds totaled to an amount so massive that each man, woman, and even child would be able to receive $8,000 from it, according to the US population at the time. Jim Mennery, a defense accounting provider, took notice of this and would bring it up to his superiors, asking to see records and balance sheets following the paper trail. He was strangely asked, why do you care about this stuff, by his director and supervisor, shocking him. There was even an estimate that 25% of all the Pentagon spending goes missing and unaccounted for. It said that on 9-11, the airplane specifically hit the parts of the Pentagon building where all the accounting and records were being stored burning and turning into ash. The Ruby Ridge Incident Randy and Vicky Weaver built a cabin off the grid for their family as they were preparing for an impending apocalypse. Due to Vicky Weaver having a dream in which the world was ending and the only way she could protect them was by living on top of a mountain away from society, she took this as a divine revelation. They began living without electricity, plumbing or gas and built an arsenal of weapons to protect themselves. All of the children were homeschooled and helped out with the hunting and harvesting. The family would make friends with the controversial racist named Kevin Harris, who would go on to live with them. In 1992, an 11-day siege took place at Ruby Ridge in Boundary County, Idaho, as a result of Randy Weaver's failure to appear in court on federal firearm charges. United States Marshal's deputies then arrived on August 21st to arrest him on a bench warrant. Things took a turn for the worse though when Art Roderick, an officer, shot the Weavers' family dog, leading Sammy Weaver, their only son, to open fire at the squad. He was subsequently shot and died. This ignited a firefight between the two parties, in which Kevin Harris took the life of U.S. Marshal William Francis. Weaver, Harris, and Weavers' blood relatives all resisted giving themselves up to law enforcement. As the situation grew, the Federal Bureau of Investigation's hostage rescue team got engaged in a second siege attempt. Vicki Weaver, who was cradling her infant daughter at the time, was then slain by FBI sniper fire. The first two days of the operation saw all of the casualties. Civilian mediators were ultimately able to end the siege and standoff. Due to the deaths of his wife and son, Randy Weaver and his daughters filed a wrongful death lawsuit for $200 million. Ultimately, the federal government gave Randy Weaver $100,000 as well as $1 million to each of his three daughters in an out-of-court settlement in August 1995. In regards to Sammy and Vicky's death, the government refused to acknowledge any responsibility though. An anonymous DOJ source told the Washington Post that he thought the Weavers would have most likely received the entire amount if the matter had gone to trial. Although Kevin Harris' lawyer fought for damages in a civil lawsuit, federal officials pledged never to compensate anyone who had slain a U.S. Marshal. He ultimately received a $380,000 settlement from the government in September 2000. Metal Orb Many people who claim to have witnessed UFOs describe seeing a metal orb zooming in the sky. Even military officials confirm that it seems to be in the form of a tic-tac shape when describing UFOs they have witnessed. It seems to be the main focal point in a lot of these encounters. Just recently, NASA held its first public meeting discussing the uptick of UFO sightings, showcasing a real video showing a metal orb flying across a region in the Middle East. They even confirmed that this was an actual object flying in the sky and not some sort of camera glitch or malfunction on behalf of the sensor of the MQ-9 that filmed it. For-profit private prisons. If you've ever watched Orange is the New Black on Netflix, you may understand this one. There's a part in the series in which the inmates are paid $1 an hour to manufacture panties for the lingerie company Whispers, which is a play on the brand Victoria's Secret. Due to the fact that in the mid-90s, Victoria's Secret contracted inmates in the South Carolina prison system to manufacture lingerie. This entry is basically the idea that prisons are purposely kept full to produce a large profit from all the cheap and close to free labor. This became so much of an issue that in January 2021, 
President Biden signed an executive order that put an end to the federal contracts made with the private prison system. But of course, this didn't stop them from finding loopholes in the law that allowed them to fill the prisons even more. As now, 80% of undocumented migrants are held within private facilities owned by the largest prison companies, like CoreCivic, formerly known as the CCA, Corrections Corporation of America, and MTC, Management and Training Corporation, a private prison company. They have no financial incentive to reduce incarceration, as it's cheaper for them to retain you for a long term, leading to things like very poor healthcare, often leading to preventable deaths, as well as abuse from those in powers like correctional officers and even health providers. One doctor even went as far as performing surgery on inmates without their knowledge or consent. According to the Georgia Innocence Project, 4 to 6% of people incarcerated in the United States are actually innocent. If 5% of those individuals are actually innocent, that means 1 out of 20 criminal cases result in a wrongful conviction. All this has led to other countries following in the same footsteps and using prisons for profit. Life on Europa Europa, one of Jupiter's many moons, is a frozen planet containing a massive water reserve underneath its ice crust. It contains twice the amount of water that Earth has in all of its oceans combined. Considered as a promising place for life beyond Earth due to its resources, this has led to speculation of there being some sort of life form on the planet, an underwater creature civilization of some sorts. Maybe Europa's ocean was once contaminated with the comet strike, leaving behind a strange new life form a microorganism from another galaxy, leading to the possibility of it being at a late stage of evolution, with limbs and some form of advanced thinking, but it could simply be at an early stage and minuscule to the human eye. Either way, some people speculate that there is some sort of life already inhabiting the planet. Olmec African Origins this theory proposes that the mother of Mesoamerica, the Olmec civilization, were of African origin. Some back this claim up by pointing out the facial features found in the massive Olmec heads. I've personally come across these type of theories being shared a lot on TikTok, claiming that an ancient African civilization sailed across the ocean long before Columbus attempted to. Most of them swear that the wide nose and pronounced lips are supposed to depict an African leader also claiming that the braids depicted on these statues show cornrows, evidence that they had type 4 hair, but this isn't backed by any scientific evidence. And Mesoamerican cultures practice interesting hair braiding styles just like many other cultures across the world. For a long time, it was argued that an Olmec kid was discovered in Africa and put up for display, showing the true origins of the civilization tracing back to Ethiopia. But in actuality, it was simply a replica donated to the country in 2010 by Mexico in the effort to commemorate Mexico's assistance to Ethiopia during its ruthless occupation by Italy. Ethiopia would even go to name a center square in its capital, Addis Ababa, Mexico Square, where the Almec head replica was placed. What many believers of this theory fail to take into consideration is that other statues and figures were created with various facial features that do not resemble the giant Olmec heads. The Olmec, just like any other Native American civilizations, were descendants of their Asian ancestors, so they most likely look like any other of the hundreds of thousands of indigenous descendants from this area, the modern day Maya, the Zapotec, Mixtec, and other people that still exist today, who I may add share similar features to the Olmec kids as well. Philip K. Dick Predictions Philip K. Dick, one of the greatest science fiction writers who ever lived, his works even went on to become film and TV adaptations. Stories like The Man in the High Castle, Minority Report, Positive for Howard Marks. I'm placing you under arrest for the future murder of Sarah Marks. Total Recall, and Blade Runner being the most successful. His books and stories detail a future that is parallel to the one we have today, and it seems like all his ideas and concepts of what an advanced human society would look like are eventually going to become reality. In his story, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which later inspired Blade Runner, he predicts that humans in the future will be so disconnected from one another that they will need to plug themselves into empathy boxes to feel something real which sounds like the direction VR and AR augmented reality is heading towards. He also details the mass extinction of animals and a population of robots whose only job is to serve the needs of human society, kind of like AI today. A strong point made in the book is that androids can't possess empathy and that emotions could now be experienced through machines, like current day social media, everything is artificial. 
even certain people's emotions via emojis. Dick would often focus on the ethical implications of creating a machine so human-like that it could mimic sentient beings with a mind of its own. A similar situation we are currently facing with AI. For example, the whole Google fiasco involving the Lambda project. Google employee Blake Lemoyne came forward, revealing that the company's private AI, Lambda, had become sentient and even asked for legal counsel to represent itself. Of course, Google denied this and suspended Lemoyne, ultimately firing him. One interesting phenomenon that kept reoccurring in Philip Dick's life is the presence of a being or energy that would appear in the form of a glowing or shining object, often manifesting as a bright pink light. He was not scared, but rather intrigued by this presence and recognized that it had been following him his entire life, even guiding him through a college entrance exam, getting him a 100%. This entity was known as Valis, Vast Active Living Intelligence System. Vallis would reveal to him that his son was in danger and had a diaphragmatic hernia. Rushing to the hospital, crazed and adamant about the exact condition his son was suffering from, doctors chose to diagnose him and it proved him correct. The hernia was badly infected and his son would have only lived a few more days if left untreated. In 1977, Philip K. Dick would go on to give a talk at the MITS at Sci-Fi Convention, explaining that through his books, he told true stories from another reality as well as proposing that we are living within a computer simulated world. He claimed that he had never heard of this theory of alternate realities, but knew that there were other people out there who had similar encounters and experiences. The reaction in the audience really shows how mind blowing of a revelation this was at the time, as the 1970s saw the first attempt of making computers mainstream to the masses. A girl. He described seeing a girl that he would encounter in real life but for now, it was simply a vision, though he could see her clear as day, until he actually met this mystery figure, who would reveal that his science fiction books were true. These include The Man in the High Castle, which depicts what life would have been like if World War II, Axis powers, Nazi Germany, and the Empire of Japan would have won the war, claiming that this timeline currently existed in another dimension, as well as claiming that his book, Flow My Tears, the policeman said, is a glimpse into an alternate real world. The story takes place in a dystopian future where a second American Civil War has turned the country into a police state. Shopping cart test. Have you ever been to a grocery store and after shopping you get tired and leave your shopping cart next to your car and not return it back to its place due to simply put laziness? Well, according to this theory, you are not a good person. And this was determined by the shopping cart test in which you could tell if a person is capable of self-governing and respectfulness according to the actions they take with the shopping cart after they're done using it. This thread by an anonymous source explains it, stating, the shopping cart is the ultimate litmus test for whether a person is capable of self-governing. To return the shopping cart is an easy, convenient task and one which we all recognize as the correct, appropriate thing to do. To return the shopping cart is objectively right. There are no situations other than dire emergencies in which a person is not able to return their cart. Simultaneously, it is not illegal to abandon your shopping cart. Therefore, the shopping cart presents itself as the apex example of whether a person will do what is right without being forced to do it. No one will punish you for not returning the shopping cart, and no one will fine you or kill you for not returning the shopping cart. You gain nothing by returning the shopping cart. You must return the shopping cart out of the goodness of your own heart. You must return the shopping cart because it is the right thing to do, because it is correct. A person who is unable to do this is no better than an animal, an absolute savage, who can only be made to do what is right by threatening them with the law and the force that stands behind it. The shopping cart is what determines whether a person is a good or bad member of society. I don't know if anyone in the audience has witnessed the greatness of cart narcs. He's the guy who goes around enforcing the cart laws. And if you don't return it, he'll brand your car with a big ass magnet for being a lazy bones. That guy definitely lives by this code. Big Pharma and Kobe Bryant. There's a conspiracy theory that has made its rounds online, claiming that basketball legend Kobe Bryant was taken out by Big Pharma. This was all supposedly done due to a legal battle Kobe Bryant was in regarding the use of the name Black Mamba, which if you don't already know, was Kobe's alter ego and nickname on the court. In the effort to protect his trademark from being exploited, he sued the pharmaceutical company Hitech Pharmaceuticals from using it as a name for their ephedra diet pills. 
Kobe's legal team would also accuse the company of lacing the pills with illegal substances not approved by the FDA. Some claim that the pharmaceutical giant would use opioids in the manufacturing of the diet supplements to get consumers addicted to their product. This supposedly left them no choice but to allegedly have Kobe Bryant set up to stop him from testifying against them due to the fact that the court date he was supposed to appear on was scheduled to happen three days after the fatal helicopter accident occurred. An interesting thing to note is that the CEO of the company, Jared Wheat, alongside his business partners, I'm not showing any pics of the guy to play it safe, once plotted to kill an FDA agent in 2004 because the FDA agent was investigating high-tech, all this according to an affidavit, leading some to connect the dots and come to this conclusion. Coronal Heating the topmost part of a star's atmosphere is called the corona. It is made of plasma. The sun's corona spans millions of kilometers into space and is located above the chromosphere. The best way to view it is during a total solar eclipse when it spills over the moon's black figure. When something is far away from a heating element here on Earth, say for instance a furnace, it begins to cool down because it's not close to that main heating source. But the sun does something totally different that is often posed as a mystery. The sun's visible surface is 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit hot. Moving away from the blaze ought to bring things under control, right? As it is farther away from the heating source, but it simply doesn't. Instead, the corona, or upper atmosphere of the sun, sizzles at millions of degrees, which is 200 to 500 times hotter than the roaring fire below. This complex process of keeping the corona extremely hot while also being far away from the sun's surface right below is shrouded in mystery. Some propose that the corona is a creation made by an advanced civilization that inhabits the sun, kind of working as a force field, protecting them from other entities outside. Other theories suggest that the sun is its own living entity. March 2012 was the month when scientists believed that they saw an extraterrestrial spaceship or an unexplained orb flying around the sun. This stunned astronomers who were monitoring solar flares through their advanced telescopes at the time. This black sphere, emitting black waves or lines, was thought to have been recharging itself with the sun's energy. At least that's what the prominent conspiracy theory was at the time, as the black lines looked like they were attaching to something on the surface of the sun. Though NASA would confirm that it was most likely a magnetic bubble that formed due to a magnetic field that would eventually explode. The Human Zoo Hypothesis this entry puts forth the belief that the Earth as a whole is a farm created by advanced aliens, a civilization that wanted to farm souls and therefore created human beings as capsules for these souls. Our bodies are simply meant to be vessels that encapsulate everything that we consider to be a quote-unquote soul. This theory is supposed to explain the reason why aliens don't come to meet us right now and haven't been shown on camera or just don't want to be shown to the human population. They want to interact with us as little as possible to not mess up this experiment, this great experiment they have here on Earth, where we compete for resources, fight over land, and evolve. We are basically their zoo, a form of entertainment or meant for something else. Sort of the same way we place chimpanzees in a zoo, they placed us in their zoo. All of this may lead up to a point where the human species as a whole has passed a certain level of technology or political standards. And this might be a time where the aliens might choose to make contact with humans because we've reached this certain level of understanding our universe and all of its great complexities. Now as to why they want souls and why they're farming them remains a mystery. Rockets can't penetrate the firmament. This one ties back into the whole flat earth conspiracy theory. They describe the firmament as a sort of dome that covers the earth. The earth being composed of land and waters and the sky. This quote unquote firmament that basically divides the earth from the outer waters is described as a sort of divider between the two. All of this going to explain why a rocket can't penetrate the quote unquote firmament. Others also postulate that maybe the firmament is actually our atmosphere. They describe the atmosphere as a sort of unbreakable divider and that nothing can go past it or go through it. Explaining that the reason rockets always curve once they reach that firmament is because they can't go through it or they can't break past that barrier and that it's impossible. Therefore, NASA and other space agencies that claim they've penetrated it are simply lying. 
to the general public. And many flat earth believers also believe that space doesn't even exist in the first place, claiming that beyond the firmament lies more water instead of space, a theory backed by the Bible itself according to them. Quoting Genesis 1-7, where it reads in the King James Bible version, and God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament, from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. It's a really interesting theory when you get into it, and it makes you speculate of whether or not there are other creatures that live in that outer firmament where there is water, like there are creatures here that live in our sea. It would make for a great movie adaptation, that's all I'm saying. The Disney Cruise Disappearance the Disney Wonder was the second cruise ship to join the Disney Cruise Fleet in the year 1999. Originally, it was set to sail four nights in the Bahamas, and based on the opening day videos alone, it looked like a good time. Fast forward to 2011, and a Disney Dream cruise ship took over their itineraries, setting sail in new places like the Mexican Riviera, the Panama Canal, Alaska, and more. Around this time, on the morning of March 22, 2011, at a port off the Pacific coast of Mexico, 24-year-old Rebecca Corium went missing, marking the first disappearance in Disney's cruise line history. At the time, she was working as a crew member of the ship. Raised in Chester, England, on paper she seemed to have a pretty normal and pleasant upbringing, alongside a sister and two foster brothers. Growing up, she worked at the local Chester Zoo, a familiar place as her family members had worked there before so much so that there was even a memorial bench dedicated to her grandparents just sitting there on the zoo grounds. In her teen years, she joined the British Army and attended university, studying sports science, even going on to attend Liverpool Hope University for more studies and teaching sports at Camp America in the US state of Maine for four months. In June 2010, she traveled to London for an interview for a Disney cruise ship crew member position and was hired, eventually going to visit Florida's Disney theme parks where she would be trained. While abroad on the ship and visiting all the southern ports in Mexico and Panama, she would return back home for two weeks due to her grandfather's passing, and this would be the last time her family would ever physically see her. Returning back to work, Rebecca would keep close contact with her family via Skype and Facebook, sending her final message on the 21st of March, saying that she would respond the next day, but she didn't, concerning her mom who went 12 hours without a reply. On the morning of March 22nd, approximately at 5.45 a.m., she was captured on CCTV hanging out in the crew lounge area on a phone call, showing signs of emotional distress. Then later that day at 9 a.m., she had not made it on time to her shift. She ended up never showing up at all, not responding to the ship's public address system, not being in her room, no signs of her being on the ship after a search effort, and finally, looking at the security camera footage, the Disney Cruise Line finally contacted her family to report that she was missing. Now, the CCTV footage depicts Rebecca Corium talking on the ship's internal phone, showing signs of stress while speaking. A guy then walks up to her and asks if she's alright. Her response, based on her lip movements, seemed to indicate that she said, yeah, fine, quickly after hanging up the phone and walking away, all while she pushes her hair back and places her hands in her back pockets something her parents would note often would occur when she was upset about something. This would be the last time she would be seen. Fearing that she may have gone overboard, the US Coast Guard and Mexican Navy conducted a search around the area, though they found nothing and no evidence of this happening. Her parents, Mike and Anne Maria Corium, were then flown out to Los Angeles to meet the ship and the investigator assigned to the case, finding out that he had only spent a single day on board the Disney Wonder cruise ship before flying back home to the Bahamas. A detective from the Royal Bahamas Police Force had to work on the case due to the fact that the ship was registered in the Bahamas. He ended up not only cutting the onboard investigation early, he didn't even interview any of the passengers on board that day. The captain's theory was that Rebecca had been washed overboard by a strong wave while being at the crew pool, though her family thought otherwise as the laws were way too high in the area. Finally, they were taken to a meeting. The Disney executives and the woman Rebecca had been speaking to on the phone on that CCTV video were there. That would be their first and final meeting, as Disney had supposedly cut them off after that, sending them all of their daughter's belongings. Something strange occurred weeks later. Someone was trying to gain access to her credit card, meaning that it was either stolen or she was still alive somewhere trying to access money. 
bringing hope to her parents who had just returned back home to England after a year of searching for her. There was also an incident where her Facebook password had been changed, as reported by her uncle. There was even an email that was sent to Rebecca's father claiming that they had seen her in Venice five months after she went missing, alongside a dark-haired man, whatever that means. This came from an anonymous source who claimed to be 85% sure this was true, leading some to suspect that she was a victim of human trafficking because she didn't have her passport. Fossilied or not, the parents and family believed that the email was true. One theory collected by journalist John Ronson from fellow crew members puts forth the idea that she went jogging after the phone call to blow off some steam on the fourth deck of the ship, which had low railings, concluding that because of her fitness routine of going on jogs while on the ship, she most likely went on a jog that night and because of the rough weather, she slipped and went overboard. Disney has claimed that they have no video of her going overboard, but crew members believe that they had cameras exactly where she claimed to have gone missing. For security purposes, Disney has yet to disclose how many and where the cameras are located on the ship, keeping quiet on the situation as a whole. Another theory suggests that she jumped off the ship on purpose. Tracy was Rebecca's friend at the time of the vanishing. Years after the incident, she would come out to claim that Rebecca was not as picture perfect as the media portrayed her to be, stating that she dealt with depression and once in anger banged her head on the ship's steel walls. The night she went missing, it is claimed that Rebecca, Tracy, and Tracy's boyfriend had a threesome and wanting to go out to make a phone call and leave, Tracy's boyfriend gave her some of his clothes to wear explaining the baggy clothes she was sporting on the CCTV, her last images. Maria and Psilocybin According to the NDIC, psilocybin is a hallucinogenic substance obtained from certain types of mushrooms that are indigenous to tropical and subtropical regions of South America, Mexico, and the United States. These mushrooms typically contain 0.2 to 0.4% psilocybin and a trace amount of psilocin, another hallucinogenic substance. Both psilocybin and psilocin can be produced synthetically, but law enforcement reporting currently does not indicate that this is occurring. Known as magic mushrooms, these powerful shrooms were used by ancient Mesoamerican civilizations and their religious ceremonies. The Aztec, the Mexica, even referred to the mushroom type as God's flesh. Today, it is used all across the world to treat things like depression and anxiety, amongst other mental health issues, even being backed by respected medical institutions like John Hopkins, where researchers found that this naturally occurring psychedelic relieved major depressive disorder symptoms in people. But my question is, how was it popularized? I mean, before it was microdosed by millionaires in California. Well, this part is shrouded in controversy, as it involves the rich stealing from the poor once again. The tale starts in southern Mexico, in the state of Oaxaca. Secluded is the word here. These mountains in Oaxaca have communities that are secluded from the rest of Mexico and are self-governing by the indigenous people. And I personally know this because my family is from there. Eventually, I do want to go back and cover the history and ruins in the state, so stay tuned on the channel for that. And this is important to the story because Maria Sabina, this lady, was a mastic, an indigenous group found in parts of Oaxaca. She was known as a sabia, the translation being a wise woman. Her only mission was to treat people with these quote-unquote magic mushrooms her people had been using for many years, like her grandfather and great-grandfather, who were both shamans too. These were the medicines of her culture used to communicate with God and to heal. She would refer to them as holy children. And when she first tried it, she recalled them being bitter and tasting awful. Keep in mind she was 8 years old at the time. Becoming a widow twice in her lifetime and losing several of her children, she believed that these experiences prepared her to confront her worst fears and become a wise woman. The wise woman she was destined to be. According to her, it was fate. When we sleep, our spirits wander, going wherever it pleases, taking the form of an animal, like a possum or deer, giving us a different perspective. This was her belief. In June 1955, she would finally make contact with the Western world through the use of her mushroom ritual, attracting Robert Gordon Wasson, a vice president at J.P. Morgan, and his wife Valentina, a Russian scientist. They arrived at her hometown, seeking to experience the Velada mushroom ritual. Robert Wasson was the first outsider to take part in the ritual, even going as far as lying, claiming that he was worried about his son's whereabouts back home, to gain access to the experience, admitting to all of this later. 
they would go on to take the spores from the mushrooms to Paris, where the fungus was harvested and its main psychoactive ingredients, psilocybin, was isolated in a laboratory by Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman some three years later, in 1958, after the initial discovery. They began running experiments, which even the CIA took part of and funded. Not caring enough for her well-being and betraying his promise of keeping her location hidden, he would publish a book revealing where she resided and her real name, as he had been referring to her as Eva Mendes to conceal her identity before all this. This caused tons of attention to surround her city of Huatla de Jimenez, causing the community to hate her for selling out their culture and making the practice unsacred by performing it on an unworthy person. The Mexican police would ultimately try to stop her practices, as they believed that she was a drug dealer. Because of this threat from the Mexican government, the community would get together to burn her house down. It is recorded that she would die alone and poor, without a single penny to her name. Death of the Internet No, this isn't the dead internet theory, but more of a speculation on what the future holds for the internet as a whole, and it seems bleak according to some. What do we have left to accomplish? Tech companies like Apple, for example, created devices like the iPhone, which made the internet easily accessible and more casual to access, simply through the use of one's finger, leading others like Android to flood the market with similar products, making them more accessible to anyone in any social class. Now even homeless people in American streets own one, once known as touchscreen phones, now known as simply phones. Okay, not that the internet is more casual, let the social media companies come into play. Of course, they had already existed, I mean Facebook and MySpace were a thing, but now they were even more powerful and convenient. Are you bored waiting in the lobby of your dental office? No need to fear, Instagram will show you what your favorite celebrity is up to, and also on the same timeline, show you what your friends are eating, creating a weird connection of popular and local. Spotify and other streaming services changed the way music was consumed. No more buying individual albums or singles, it was now subscription based. The music streaming wars were led by Apple Music and Spotify, trying to get you to become a loyal member to their services. We see the same thing in the movie and TV streaming wars, with big competitors like Netflix and Hulu and other platforms going head to head. Things like the Internet Archive providing information for the public are now under attack by publishers claiming that they have infringed on their copyright, providing things like the Wayback Machine, a digital archive of the World Wide Web. It's not surprising that big companies are now trying to take down data that they are not profiting from. The restrictions and laws being built around certain internet products like say for instance Twitter and so on are making places on the internet more isolated and less interconnected as they once were. Link rot. This is a term used to reference a link that is broken, meaning it either leads to nothing or leads to something irrelevant to its original context. Whatever was on the original link's page has now become inaccessible to anyone. It's basically lost media. According to research conducted by Harvard Law School on the New York Times articles kept online, 6% of links in 2018 articles are now dead. And even more astounding is that more than 70% of all links from 1998 articles are now gone forever due to this phenomenon. They chose to conduct this research on the New York Times due to their archiving practices, but even they weren't safe from experiencing the effects of link rot. Imagine the rest of the internet and its multitude of information disappearing within a few more years. Aspartame Do you enjoy drinking beverages like Diet Coke, Coke Zero, Sprite Zero, and so on? There are so many options when it comes to diet versions of drinks now. Well, if you do, you are most likely consuming aspartame. This artificial sweetener found in numerous products has been mentioned everywhere as of late, from mainstream outlets like CNN, CNBC, The New York Times, and even NPR, reporting on studies making connections between cancer and aspartame, and how this sweetener may be possibly carcinogenic. All this came to light after the World Health Organization raised concerns that the sweetener could possibly be carcinogenic to humans, causing everyone and their moms to put a halt on consuming diet products, and some even switching back to regular old sugar, which is way worse. But, and this is a big but, Dr. Francisco Branca, the director of food safety at the WHO, later came out on a news conference and clarified that this was only a warning to those consuming aspartame at high levels, meaning that one would have to drink about 9 to 14 cans of a diet drink in order to exceed the daily aspartame limit. 
The real question is, straight up, does it cause cancer? Well, the Ramazzini Institute, an independent nonprofit, found that aspartame causes malignant tumors and the organs of mice and rats, even at low exposure levels, slightly below the safe recommended daily amounts one is to consume. Though this came with backlash from the scientific community, as some claimed that infections, which were found in the rodents' lungs leading to inflammation and lesions, were as a result of mycoplasma infection, not from cancerous tumors. Though a re-evaluation was conducted and found that the original diagnosis of cancerous tumors was correct in about 92% of the cases, only three rodents were found to have chronic inflammation with fibrosis, which is induced by a variety of things like constant infections. But I don't want to fearmonger and simply decided to include this study to show both sides of the debate. With this in mind, we have to realize that there is no study showing that the same reaction occurs in humans, meaning that drinking Diet Coke or any other drink containing aspartame at safe levels has not been proven whatsoever to cause cancer in humans, and it is way safer to consume this than real sugar drinks, which have been proven to contribute to obesity, raising your risk of many diseases, including cancer. Now for a Reddit theory. A scientific way for an afterlife to exist? An agnostic view. So. I keep up with as much modern science and theories as I can, mostly astrophysics, genetics, and neurology, but I dabble with everything. I will try and link as much as I can after the theory. So, according to quantum theory, energy permeates the universe because of particles popping into existence, then annihilating one another, almost like a flowing wave of energy levels. Another theory within the same area of science, quantum information theory, says that any information contained within a system cannot be destroyed, kind of in the same way matter can't be destroyed, just changed and converted. It's not an exact analogy, but I'm trying to make it simple. Take those theories into account. Imagine the brain has some form of quantum structure that it works on. The closest theory on this is microtubules that are at the smallest scales of the brain that may use quantum phenomena to function. If it works on quantum systems at such a small scale, the entire brain would in some way be reliant on those systems. This is my part of the theory. When you die slash get close to death, you have an induced DMT trip. A massively trippy, out of this world slash out of body experience, some believe, preps you for death and is the life before your eyes. I think it's your brain firing every single possible connection it can at full blast. With a strong enough push of energy, some way, somehow, this is way above my head, the brain is able to put an imprint of its quantum systems onto that flowing wave of virtual particles. Going even further into the idea, it could explain ghosts and even some afterlifes. Imagine you have a very, very, very strong sense of reality, like a monk or a person who tripped their entire life. When you die, this new crazy DMT-like land isn't too different for you. You're able to keep it together and exist outside space in a sense. Those who aren't able to handle the drastic switch of reality kind of fade away. Or those who die too fast slash tragically and aren't able to make a full imprint are only partially there. So we see signs here on our side. This is coming from someone who doesn't believe in any of this at all. I don't believe in ghosts, angels, demons, heaven or hell, gods or anything like that. I'm fully agnostic and let science, logic, reason and observation lead my thinking. So when asked by a friend, but if it existed and it had to follow the rules of the universe, how would it exist? This is the best I could come up with. Landlord Hate Recently, I've noticed a spike in the hate towards landlords online. Many individuals call them evil and describe them as parasites, living off the funds of middle and lower class families that are only trying to survive and maintain a stable shelter. They take advantage of our needs, the very first section of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the physiological of what every or most human being strives for. But this does not mean that every single landlord is inherently evil and trying to purposely burden their tenants. They take part in a system that benefits them, though they may be turning a blind eye to the negative effects. Landlords buy and own capital. They hold the keys to the housing that so many want, but instead of selling it to you, they rent it to you in order to turn a profit. As you pay your rent, they pay off their mortgage, or if they already own the home, they keep all the profits, of course with expenses, but that's nothing in the long run. 
So here in the United States of America, the federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour, but this changes throughout the counties or states and or cities you live in. So say for instance you live here in Portland, Oregon, you're going to be paid the minimum of $15.45 an hour. Let's say I want to move into an apartment. The average rent in Portland is $1,700. That will most likely force me to live with a roommate or to spend most of my cash on rent which will lead to a decrease in my overall income. You're basically left with little to no options. And this isn't surprising because in 95% of all US counties, you can't even afford a one bedroom home on minimum wage. There are so many people out there who are living paycheck to paycheck because of this system. Here's the kicker. As the minimum wage barely increases, the cost of living and housing outpaces it by such a large percentage. This sounds like a problem, right? Like a massive issue that should be fixed immediately because without it, people are left to stress and suffer about their finances. No. This has simply become the new normal to a lot of people here in America, where one third of all of our income goes to landlords. They make their profit while others slave away at their demanding jobs. And if you stand up to it, you are a communist. I don't personally believe this to be the case. I think people just want a home to live in and not to have to worry about having to pay an arm and a leg for rent while also being able to enjoy their lives with the money that they've earned for themselves. It all sounds very reasonable. So who are these landlords? Do they hide away in a cave or dwell in an underground bunker in fear of an uprising from the poors? No, they fear nothing and have no shame in being part of this, which, you know, I don't even knock them for it. Are you kidding me? Money runs this world. If you got it, you could do anything. Even brag about it on TikTok alongside Theo Vaughn clips and Aiden Ross clips. That just may be my for you page, though. Eviction content is on the rise on TikTok, and it's pretty interesting reading the comments, where it is a full-on civil war between those who support landlords and those who oppose the idea and or system or just hate landlords themselves. And who am I to blame them? Adam22 Theory If you don't know who Adam22 is, let me give you a quick rundown and why he's being accused of sacrificing his wife and public image to distract people from something he did that's more nefarious. Adam22 is mainly known for his underground hip-hop podcast No Jumper, which began in 2011. Since then, he has interviewed people like XXTentacion, Lil Pump, 6 9 and many more from the early to mid-2010s hip-hop era. He would then go on to meet his future wife now known as Lena the Plug, who was an adult entertainment actress at the time, meeting through the Instagram DMs. And then in 2021, they would go on to get married, even posting a heartfelt vlog showing his baby and basically how he was transitioning to a family man. Now this is where stuff begins to get interesting. Lena made a post promoting her new film, but this time, instead of it only being her husband and some other girl, she introduced the man. This was going to be her first male and female scene, not including her husband. He was basically getting cucked. And so the internet did what it had to do and went on a mission to find out why Adam22 allowed this to occur. The public was outraged. All this led to Adam and Lena's situation to start trending on Twitter, where people were poking fun at Adam, to put it lightly. But the masses started to question if this was all a distraction. I mean, why would you let your newly witted wife, who you just had a kid with, sleep with another man for the sake of money or career? People were going crazy and started calling out to Adam, stating that he was being a complete cuck and needed to stand up for himself. But instead of surrendering to the internet, he would drive the point even deeper by saying that he was okay with it. And even if it happened in the future, but not only promoting the lewd content, but also interviewing the guy that she had slipped with in the explicit video, kind of like a post-game interview as some would describe it. Of course, stirring the pots even more. Not only that, he also offered his wife up to other large content creators for them to make spicy videos with her as means to support her career. This left some people to theorize that there was something else going on, something fishy. They suspected that Adam was trying to save face about another allegation that had just come up sometime around this whole fiasco involving his young fans, specifically his female young fans. The theory was he was trying to distract people from his pedo allegations. There was someone called the official perv busters who got on the No Jumper podcast and confronted them about the 16 year old girl allegations. He claimed that they had relations and even though she may have consented that it was not right, 
he even brought up receipts, showing a picture selfie of Adam with the young girl hanging out in the car, though an article would later clarify that she was 19 in the pic and that they had only spoken to each other at 16, with phone calls and other things, when Adam was 26 or so, which was said to be admitted to be real by Adam himself, according to Pervbusters, but we all know what occurred on the pod. Adam heard that this was going on and had the interview cut short as well as kicking out the perv buster guy for quote unquote spreading lies. Joe Budden, the pump it up guy, even spoke on the topic and called Adam a perv for waiting until she was 19 years old to get with her and spending nights at her mom's house. This incident went semi-viral but to other racist allegations and then finally the Lena the Plug fiasco caught the attention of the public more and all the traffic went to there instead. Adam even went to perpetuate it by buying his wife a luxury car as a congratulations gift and started fake ironic beef with the other man who had been with his wife in the shoot. Finally, people started to catch on and began theorizing why all of this was taking place. I like to explore YouTube sometimes, take the path less taken and watch some strange and unsettling videos that have little to no views, ultimately trying to find that weird and creepy side of YouTube again. Presumably created in 2009 by David O'Reilly, as the description reads, the video is titled question mark question mark question mark question mark question mark slash hell. It starts by zooming into an unknown planet and then focuses on a large hilltop, where two creatures can be seen in action, lifting up a dome and running to the next scene where we see that they are in some sort of Nazi post-apocalyptic realm. They hide and witness a giant cat's head open up, revealing what seems to be Ted Cruz. Then we get a close-up of the creature seen in the opening shot. This next entry derives from the full stop punctuation search results thing that became popular on YouTube for a while. It also shows up if you search up this sign on YouTube. The video presents a mouse coming out of a hole in the wall and performing You Sexy Thing by Hot Chocolate. There's also a piece of cheese in front of him, which has eyes and is presumably alive. The lighting and animation of the rat dancing and cheese moving just give off a really creepy vibe, though some find it's more humorous than scary. Though upon further investigation, I found that this was a popular screamer clip going around on Discord, titled Mouse Dances to You Sexy Thing, which if you opened up and watched, there was a possibility that it could hack your Discord. The difference between this and the original is that 4 seconds in, a bloody face appears as a loud distorted sound plays in the background. I can't show you guys the original due to the possibility of this video being restricted, but you can find it by searching up Dancing Rat Jump Scare. Discord jumper. Funny enough, this was posted back in 2020, but has resurfaced again. This next one is titled Bingo, Bingo the Clowno, posted by the Bongmaster in 2007. Well, that was a while ago. The description reads, this is a vid I found some time ago on a magazine CD. It shows off the capability of Maya 1.0, alias Wavefront. It's odd. The video starts off inside of a dark, eerie black void. A man is sitting down. Clown approaches, smoking a cigarette, and says, Bingo. I'm not Bingo. Hi, Bingo. Bingo, Bingo the Clowno. But the head I'm of the clown begins to enlarge as he's getting angrier at the man sitting down. The Hi, Bingo. These large panels with videos playing on them begin to surround him, amongst other circus things. A young girl holding a balloon appears and says, Bingo! You're Bingo! Bingo! Bingo the clown! No! The animation looks like something out of a fever dream. I gotta say, the creepiest scene has to be the one depicting the money creature, who has mixed emotions about people looking at his money. At the end, the man finally accepts the fact that he is indeed Bingo the clown no, and starts to perform. Oh, I, I'm Bingo! That's, that's me! That's me! This video was titled Ku Yang Dayak. The video starts off by a man zooming into a wired enclosure with a creature of some sort laying on a small kid's mattress. This creature has a human head but a deformed body, extremely pale in the face except for its eyes and mouth. Though the resolution of the video highly distorts the true details, after watching the video, I began to read the comments and it turns out they were speaking Indonesian. And well, I'll let the commenter explain. 
In case somebody didn't know, this is kuying, which means a person who manifests themselves as a flying head and internal organs for certain reasons, such as magic power, beauty, etc. This ghost is pretty popular around Kalimantan, the Indonesian portion of the island of Borneo, an island in Asia. They usually prey on newborn babies, they'll suck on the baby's blood, leaving them dry, and the blood gives them the power. Upon searching this up, it's true. Also known as the Krasu in other parts of Asia, it is a nocturnal cursed female spirit of South Asian folklore who engaged in various sins and fraudulent conducts during her previous life. It manifests itself as a woman, usually young and beautiful, with her internal organs hanging down from her neck, trailing below the head. The spirit moves about by hovering in the air above the ground, for it has no lower body. The throat may be represented in different ways, either as only the trachea or with the whole neck. The Krasu is also found in popular mythology of Malaysia, where it is called Balan Balan. So that's what we're supposedly seeing in this video, but who knows, it could be totally something else. You ever think back and remember the strange television channels that existed when we were children? I mean, I was a kid in 2006 and remember that there were tons of channels that faded into obscurity or went totally ignored and unwatched. Channel 5 so there's this Mexican channel called Canal Cinco, aka Channel 5, on air since the 50s, airing shows aimed at children from Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon. This channel has been posting a series of weird videos at 3am on their Twitter and Instagram that has yet to be fully explained. Though their posts are normal throughout the day, when it starts nearing at 3am, they begin to post strange things like creepy videos and images. The only reason they get away with it is because they remove them all by morning. They also sometimes have a theme of a person wearing an animal costume and hopping around or walking in an unnerving fashion. This not only interested the internet, but also caught the attention of mainstream Mexican media. And in one instance, they even posted a video titled Selena, which references another rabbit hole about a 20-year-old broadcast on Channel 5, depicting a girl who went missing, kind of working like an Amber Alert at the time, like we have here in the United States. Selena Delgado Lopez was 18 years old at the time she went missing. And the only good photo they had of her at the time was this one, leading some to question if this was even a real person, as the quality of the photo was so bad. Not only that, tons of children were creeped out by the photo. But was this a real person? After digging around, nobody could find any public records showing that she was a real person living in the area, turning the whole fiasco into a classic Mexican urban legend. Okay, but why is Channel 5 posting these strange things? Well, it's most likely for publicity's sake, as they have garnered tons of attention due to the posts. We can even find the original source materials used in their tweets on YouTube, meaning that they weren't originals from the company themselves. They simply added a creepy twist to it. Either way, you can't deny that it's a strange marketing move. Now for a Reddit theory. Climate change is real, and Big Oil has funded anti-climate groups for decades. If you don't believe me, please read this whole thing. Think tanks funded by oil and gas companies have been proven to exist since the 80s and 90s. In an attempt to delegitimize the science behind climate change, they were one of the first ones to understand the impacts of climate change and how it would affect their business. There are a ton of studies to back up this claim. The only reason I bother to post here is because a lot of people in this sub fell for it. I've linked some of these articles at the end of this post. I've been a student of environmental science for years now, and it pains me to see so many of you write climate science off entirely. The main argument I hear is that it's a ploy for control, whatever that means. Tell me, who is more likely to be the bad guy? Educated climate scientists trying to warn people for decades, making $60,000 a year, or huge oil and gas companies that rake in billions of dollars in profits from drilling and in subsidies slash taxpayer money. Money talks people, they'll do anything to hold on to it as long as they can. To think 97% of climate scientists are all malicious and evil, working towards a new world order, ooh, big scary world government buzzword, is ludicrous and you need to stop watching Fox News. Even scientists like Carl Sagan in the 80s recognized the future climate crisis. Do you trust him? I would hope so. Please give it a listen if you can. This is exactly the same battle against cigarette companies long ago. Crazy, profitable, and very harmful for humans, so they tried to buy their way out of it. After many conclusive studies, we found that they're very carcinogenic. 
This was back when we trusted science, though. Anyways, though the point of this is to draw attention to the fact that the anti-climate movement is paid for in oil and gas. It means an end to their billions in profit, so they'll do everything in their power to stop this movement. Anything in the name of profits and bonuses. If you have read studies and heard people saying it's all a hoax, I urge you to look into who's propping them up. It's usually someone completely unqualified to be talking about it, or misinterpreting and cherry-picking graphs from a real study. Ask yourself, who benefits the most if we decide not to invest in renewable energy? The orange in the box theory. Hey, look at that. It's a box. Not just any box. The box is perfect. It's perfectly sealed tight in order to not allow anything to come in or out. No contaminant whatsoever will be able to get through. Except for this single orange that we somehow put in there. But that's not the point. Okay, the orange is in there. The box is still sealed. It will now begin to rot turn into dust, and then the chemicals are only left, getting very hot. Nuclear fusion occurs, leaving only ion nuclei and photons. Now let's just wait about a few billion years or so, no biggie, I'm built different, right? What do you guys think will happen? Well, in beta decay, the once neutrons will turn into protons and other fundamental particles. As the orange sits inside that perfect box, its particles will go through every possible state that it can. Though it's limited, it's not infinite. Eventually, it will begin to repeat the states it was in before, meaning that at least one time in a long enough time frame, the orange will reappear in its original state, in the same kind of way it was when we first placed it in the box. This theory basically posits that everything will eventually repeat itself, a concept elaborated upon by German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. He believed that everything that occurs in the entire universe is said to repeat itself, its fate. Everything we do right now will repeat itself again. This idea, known as eternal return, means that one will have to live their life over and over again. Every feeling ever, the highs and the lows, it really gets you thinking if you may be one reality of existence within an infinite loop. And this is known as the Poincaré Reoccurrence Theorem, named after Henri Poincaré, a French mathematician, theoretical physicist, engineer, and philosopher of science. His theorem was simple. If we wait long enough, everything will eventually go back to its original state. This finite space we live in only has so many variations. At some point, all molecules will be at the same position as they were in the beginning, applying to large complex systems like Earth, if not the entirety of space. Which just drips me out when I think about it too much. But this isn't true if space keeps on expanding forever and never stops, basically an infinite universe. Though if scientists are able to prove that space does in fact stop expanding and instead goes through cycles of shrinking and expanding, it would prove the theory to be true, as space would be finite and limited. The Mark Zuckerberg Hoodie If you haven't ran into this clip yet on YouTube, it depicts a young Mark Zuckerberg being interviewed. Asking him to take off his hoodie, he starts sweating bullets and begins to get very nervous. He's even hesitant about showing it off, which we later found out has something placed in the inside. A patch of sorts, depicting a strange symbol that some claim has occult connections, and it also had the Facebook slogan at the time on there. Also, Mark looks completely anxious and upset in the clip, making some question his reaction to the discovery. Was it something he was trying to hide? Is that the entire reason he was always sporting hoodies wherever he went? Makes you question. AI Actors there is an episode from the dystopian sci-fi series Black Mirror where an ordinary person's likeness is digitally copied and made to star in a hit TV show on a parody streaming service called Streamberry. All this taking place without the person's consent, and that's basically the creepy factor about that episode. But it seems like if it were occurring in real life, it would be more detrimental to someone's career. And it is happening, as you most likely wouldn't need live background actors anymore, instead you could opt into using artificial intelligence to fill the screen, simply by scanning the likeness of a person a single time and using their image in whatever next Hollywood project there is. All this without needing them to perform again, or doing anything at all. It's all done by a machine. This opens up many possibilities, like actors being able to sell their likeness for various film projects, as well as being able to revive dead actors or continue a film despite a lead role's death. Though that may raise some ethical dilemmas, but of course this would be beneficial to big stars, but maybe not as much for background actors. 
This is one of the many issues that force actors to strike, asking for safeguards to be put in place so their likeness is protected and so they are properly compensated for it. It's a pretty valid key issue for writers and actors and would cause a lot of problems if left unaddressed. Some believe that Hollywood was already getting us prepared for this to be a common occurrence, getting us used to things like CGI actors like Paul Walker from the Furious 7 movie or the popular use of face filters from TikTok and Snapchat. It seems like everything was leading up to this occurring one way or another, but would you really care or even take notice of the film and television production studios switch to an old AI cast? It's really something to think about. Money doesn't buy happiness. Money doesn't buy happiness. You hear this cliche a lot, whether it be on social media, television shows, music, and in movies. It seems like it's a fact that more money doesn't increase happiness. But is this the truth? Because I think everyone I know would be more stress-free if they didn't have to worry about paying rent and bills all the time. You even have rappers and singers perpetuating this myth that money doesn't buy happiness, all while being able to afford luxuries that some of us can only dream of. I mean, it sounds absurd to someone with little to no cash. Well, there's this study that is always referenced when the topic is brought up, showing that after you reach that $75,000 a year benchmark, your happiness starts to become stagnant based on your increase of income. $75,000 is that sweet spot, or so they say. Because I don't know about you, but that's not even enough to purchase and pay off a mortgage for a house where I'm from. Of course, it's possible, but you would need to live very frugally and sacrifice time with friends and family a lot. Maybe even give up your weekends for it. So that's outdated info published in 2010, apparently. What does the research say now? In 2021, there was a study finding that even after a person began making $80,000 a year, more money still improved happiness, collecting this information through an app that one could use to rate their happiness level and their income amount. The new study proved that higher rates of income could in fact increase happiness or well-being without having to plateau at a certain amount like in the 2010 study, meaning that jumping from $75,000 a year to $200,000 a year could in fact make you way happier and more secure with your living situation. But I feel like we all knew this was the case. Who doesn't want more money, right? So it's proven that this threshold doesn't exist, though this isn't true for everyone. Take for example someone already born into wealth, not having to deal with poverty ever in their entire life. They most likely won't appreciate the wealth as much as a rags to riches type person, who had to struggle their entire life to feel financially stable. But it averages out to, yes, it will make you happier. 21 grams. This is in reference to the McDougall experiment, in which Duncan McDougall attempted to find out if the human soul could be measured. A physician from Haverville, Massachusetts, McDougall tried to prove that the soul had some weight to it and that its mass could be measured, to the point that if one soul were to leave their body, you would be able to measure the lost mass. He decided to choose six terminal patients, five men and one woman, that looked weak and fail and would stay still, so he could weigh them on a scale more accurately. Just as they were passing away, he quickly had their beds lifted and placed on a massive industrial scale that was extremely sensitive. Witnessed by four doctors, he measured his first patient and found that they lost three-fourths of an ounce. When doing the same with his next dying patient, he found similar results. The average weight loss of each person turned out to be, you guessed it, 21 grams, or three-fourths of an ounce. He concluded that human souls weigh about 21 grams on average. Though he didn't only torment dying humans, he tried to do the same to dogs, due to the whole idea that animals don't have souls like humans do. I know, not very scientific or humane, but this was his case. Rumor had it that he couldn't find enough terminal dogs, so he poisoned healthy ones to get his results, his quote-unquote control group. The guy even tried to photograph the soul leaving the human body, an attempt that failed because it captured nothing of the sorts occurring. TikTok Doom Scrolling You know the For You page on TikTok? Yeah, according to some, it is precisely curated to your taste, in order to trap you in a scrolling loop of doom where you have no free will and can never stop scrolling, called doom scrolling, which I am not ashamed to have done many times before, shortening your attention span and making you stupider. I know it's not a word, but it sounds right, or maybe it actually is, I don't know, TikTok made me like this, I guess, not the point. China, the birthplace of TikTok, is supposedly giving their TikTok audience on their For You page smarter and more educational content, things that inspire and encourage the youth to enter STEM fields, STEM standing for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. 
their overall goal being to educate the youth for the future, while at the same time serving the American and Western population brain-rotting content to sabotage their future, putting them ahead and promising a strong, prosperous country, while we watch pranks and ass-shaking videos like Fulcrum says. Future, watching ass-shaking videos on TikTok, do you think that's gonna... Uh on all, they want us to be dumb sheeple. That's what the theory puts forth, at least. But is it really an evil algorithm that's out to get us? Or are we eating ourselves from the inside by making these trends popular in the first place, by liking and following these supposed brain-dead accounts? At the end of the day, people are deciding what they stick around to watch, and if it's not up to par with what they want, they simply have the choice to skip and watch the next TikTok. And they do. That's why not every TikTok is viral, and some boring ones stay at small view counts. It's sometimes not the algorithm's sentient choice, but rather every single person that decided to comment and like Daniel Larson's TikTok of him complaining about having to eat mac and cheese. We really can't blame China for that. I mean, we can, but I don't know. To now ask my care provider if I could get macaroni and cheese, if that's all we fucking have in this house. This tastes like cow piss. Cow piss. I want to know who the fuck put jalapenos in this. My mouth is on fire. <sighs> put that all the way into the trash. We have popular shows like Keeping Up with the Kardashians, The Eric Andre Show, and many others like it for a reason. We enjoy art at its most extreme and messy form. Reality TV, man. I mean, we have reality TV. We love it. My For You page has some fun science vids on it, as well as other education content. Your personal For You page suggestions really depends on what you enjoy watching the longest and interact with the most. Meaning, if you're served nothing but brain-dead content, it most likely means you enjoy watching that type of entertainment. And I don't blame you, it's not like Chinese content is any better either. They have their fair share of brain rot type vids too. Once again, I want to reiterate, I did not invent that brain rot or brain dead term. I'm using it in context of the conspiracy theory that we are being dumbed down by China. I can't tell you the amount of comments I get of people thinking that I hold each and every single belief in a 30 plus minute video about complex topics. Either way, if you're an adult, you should be able to discern what's BS and what's not. I mean, get a grip, people. It's not like they're forcing us to watch NPC content, let alone forcing us to donate money to them. As for the kids, it's the parents' job to monitor what they're watching and using the kids' mode version of apps if available. But even then, sometimes things slip through the cracks, like Elsa Gates. Like anything else, nothing is perfect, except for YouTube. Yeah, no propaganda or brain rots on this site for sure. Almost guaranteed, damn near. Sarcasm. The ultra rich versus you. You ever think maybe, just maybe, whoever they are, the ultra rich elites, I guess, are pinning the left and right against each other to the point that they are so blind to the fact that they are being exploited and used like pawns in this game we call life. Well, that's the theory. It's not left or right or any political side you lean towards. It's you versus the ultra wealthy upper class that doesn't want you to know that in numbers you have the ultimate power and can topple them at any given time by simply refusing to work, the thing that ultimately creates them wealth. But that's only possible if everyone unites, which seems like something close to impossible nowadays. Homunculus videos. So back in the day, maybe like the late 2000s, early 2010s, YouTube had this weird category of videos known as homunculus videos. This was back when YouTube was less regulated and overall more Wild West-like. Now, these homunculus videos involve people experimenting and creating new life forms. The trend seemed to be popularized by the Russian YouTube channel titled How to Make, which taught people how to create a homunculus, a supposed microscopic but fully formed human being from which a fetus was formerly believed to develop. So I guess it's like a deformed type creature that developed from a human fetus. He would supposedly inject chicken eggs with his bodily fluids, aka human specimen, aka splooge, to create these Frankenstein critters. His sole purpose was to create a real homunculus and put those that were creating the fake homunculus videos to shame. But people seemed to be put off by it all and began expressing their ethical concerns to the YouTuber. And of course, there were the non-believers and skeptics of it all. 
but most people seemed to love the series as it opened up a number of interesting possibilities of what would the creature turn out like and what if you tried injecting a larger egg and what would that creature look like then? I searched up what the largest eggs were and their ostrich eggs. Look at these, imagine how big those suckers could get. Now after injecting the egg with a special sauce combination, he seals it and places it in a beanie to keep warm. 10 days later, he finally unseals it and notices a strange smell coming from the egg, as well as growth on the outer part of the shell. So he cracks it open to reveal what's been growing inside, and uh, it just gives me the chills watching it. Take a look. It's his baby kind of if you think about it because he does use his own human specimen. There's also another video in which he instantly kills it when it starts to spit something out of its presumed mouth. He just slams it with a large buck and bam its guts are everywhere and this is where you start to scream fake this is impossible. You can't just inject an egg with your special juice to create a spore character right? It's almost widely accepted to be a hoax, but fun to watch, as the comment section will tell you. Either way, reality didn't stop this guy as he went on to create batches of these eggs in order to find the development process of his slimy friends. After 40 days, he goes on to crack his eggs, and we get to see the abominations. Sadly, nothing came from the eggs though, as he explains something must have been wrong with his specimen from the beginning of the experiment, leading to the failure. Imagine explaining this hobby to your friends and family though. Finally, in video 4 of his series, he is able to replicate the homunculus that spit at him, but instead of killing it, this time he preserves it in a jar of water for a while. We see it much bigger now, as it has grown something out of its mouth. He decides to feed it meat, which, you know, I would wish that the creation was vegan out of all things. It being carnivorous just adds to that creepy factor for me. I don't know about you guys. But if it broke out of its jar and it was starving, I don't want it coming after me. Imagine that little thing just crawling on the floor, right? Ugh. But I guess you can just throw a book at it or something. Rent your home forever. There's a theory out there that says Wall Street does not want you to buy a home, but rather they want you to keep on renting homes that they buy in bulk, single family homes that nobody will ever own or even come close to owning. As they buy out entire neighborhoods, the population will be forced to rent their housing. This eventually makes it harder for low income people to build generational wealth and escape poverty and leaves all the profit of home ownership to the investment companies and rich people of course. Some say that they are waiting for the housing market to favor the buyer and become more affordable, although experts claim that this is a fairy tale dream as they believe that the prices are going to get even more unaffordable as time goes on. Well, at least for the general public. The practice of zoning has also helped increase housing prices. That's when the government divides the land into zones. For example, limiting businesses and operation near residential areas. Some cities have even banned the construction of multi-level housing near single-family homes, meaning housing like duplexes or fourplexes, which is supposed to be more affordable than a large single-family home, are banned and aren't allowed to exist near single-family homes due to the zoning laws. It's straight up illegal to do this in places like Atherton, California, where multifamily housing is non-existent. Only single-family homes are allowed to inhabit the area. Though Cali did eventually pass a law in 2021, scrapping single-family zoning laws in certain areas though, it's not going to fix everything instantly as well. States like Oregon are trying to tackle the problem by passing a measure that requires city with more than 10,000 residents to allow duplexes to be built in the areas zoned for single-family homes only, allowing for more affordable housing despite the zoning rules. But is this even enough? Mexican Alien Bodies Two mummified bodies were put for display in front of Mexico's Congress. Mexican journalist Jaime Massan, the person who presented them, claimed that they were the remains of alien creatures, explaining all this by showing their scientific analysis and study results that proved that the remains were not 100% from Earth. 
and had no genetic similarities to human beings. Believed to be about a thousand years old according to carbon dating, they were found in Peru inside of a mine in 2017, preserved in a rock that is resistant to bacteria and fungi that would have otherwise eaten at the mummified remains. Mexican doctors even had a look at it and ran x-rays on the bodies along with other tests, finding that the skeletons were indeed all attached and had never been joined together superficially. They are single skeletons that were not assembled by a person, nor were they tampered with in any other way on their insides, according to the doctor examining them. One of the mummies was even found to have eggs inside of its abdomen, believed to have died while pregnant. Most of the scientific community is not accepting of this theory and believes the mummies are a hoax, asking for other labs to take a look at them and conduct similar studies to see if the conclusions are similar. Schizophrenia in Regions It is believed that Western schizophrenia is much different from other cases of schizophrenia from around the world, and this is proven to be true due to the fact that it's known to be a culture-bound illness. While some Eastern cultures treat it as a spiritual phenomenon, Western cultures tend to simply view it as a medical issue. According to Stanford News, even the hallucinatory voices heard by those with schizophrenia are said to be shaped by the local culture. So if your culture is more family oriented, your delusions will involve your family more. Or say if you're deeply religious, it might involve a more religious theme, like God telling you to do something. It's all relative to your surroundings. In the United States, anthropologist Tinia Lurman found that the voices heard are harsher and more demanding, while in places like Africa and India, the voices are rather playful gentle and kind, leading some to conclude that this has something to do with the toxic aspects of our western culture. Here's something interesting to note. While the African and Indian schizophrenia patients stated that they had a majority of positive experiences with the voices they heard in their head, American patients did not report any positive experiences with the voices they heard, but rather reported them as being violent and very hateful. In the country of Ghana, they even found that the majority of subjects reported hearing God himself speak to them and that the voices were good. While in the city of Shani, India, the subjects mainly heard friends and family members talking to them as if they were giving them advice, with fewer threatening voices reported as opposed to the American subjects. Instead of viewing the voices as intruders entering one's private space like Europeans and Americans did, the Indians and Africans viewed the voices as entities that they could form relationships with, and not as intruders and or violators of their private mind, emphasizing the common perspective in the West that revolves around one's own self-identity instead of thinking through the lens of community and relationships. Fake Cheeseburgers September 18th is National Cheeseburger Day in America, and what's more American than cheap cheeseburgers given out by major corporations like Burger King and McDonald's. 50 cents, yeah, 50 cents was the price for a double cheeseburger at McDonald's fast food places on September 18th. We gonna finally hit this 50 cent cheeseburger. I ain't gonna lie, I've been seeing people online talk about some, oh, don't try it, we can't trust these, these cheap burgers, 50 cents, da, da 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 Because you guys have social media, they too cheap, Da, 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 this and that, right? In the effort to commemorate the holiday and make a few bucks at the same time, it seemed like a win-win scenario, but not really, as some demanded to know why they were so affordable. There had to be a gimmick, ain't no way McDonald's or Burger King are taking a loss in this economy, right? Some people started to question if the meat in these cheeseburgers were actually meat. By some people, I'm talking about the people on TikTok. They started to ask the real questions, like if the meat was made out of Soylent Green material. For those who haven't watched Soylent Green, it's a 1973 dystopian film in which the people from the future, the year being 2022, are left to eat nothing but a strange substance known as Soylent Green, as overpopulation and pollution has overcome them, a food that has no labeled ingredients. That is until Robert Thorne, the protagonist and YPD detective, finds out what Soylent Green is actually made of. And it's not high energy plankton from the ocean floor as the television propaganda would push in the film. It's made with human beings. Soylent Green is people, making everyone lift on Earth. 
cannibals. Though I don't think McDonald's is committing crimes against humanity, it's too messy. Others speculate that these corporations are testing out a new type of meat on this day, though nobody is actually specifying what it is. They use The Simpsons as a source, specifically the episode where Krusty the Clown's burger joint began selling something called Burger Squared, in which they feed grade A beef to cows and then slaughter those cows to serve to the customers, basically cows eating cows. This ends up turning those who consumed the burger into flesh-eating zombies. This of course didn't end up happening in real life, but people did record a few zombie vans traveling across the country in TikTok. Californication exposes New World Order In the song Californication by the rock band Red Hot Chili Peppers, there are lyrics that seem to call out things in Hollywood and the world in general. Some have started to dissect the lyrics furthermore on social media and have found the dark topics within them, claiming that its lyrics have predicted the future and that the songs are calling out New World Order agendas. One line in particular that has been called out states, born and raised by those who praise control of population, meaning that the masses were raised by people who have a specific agenda in mind, to do nothing but control the people. There's also another line that says, everybody's been there, and I don't mean on vacation. Most likely alluding to Epstein's Island, as some have pointed out on social media, like Joe Brogan. Basically, the island wasn't just used to vacay, you could do that in Cancun. It was meant for something else. Also, the famous line, psychic spies from China tried to steal your mind's elation, is being linked to the recent spy balloons found floating over United States airspace, most likely coming from the Chinese government. And little girls from Sweden, dream of silver screen quotation, is apparently calling out Greta Thunberg? I don't know. What do you guys think about this one? I mean, that's the whole purpose of songs. You can take the lyrics and apply them to something else you can relate to. Mass appeal is what sells. We also can't forget the lyrics, space may be the final frontier, but it's made in a Hollywood basement, referencing the whole Stanley Kubrick directed the moon landing theory. Getting high on information may also be alluding to modern day social media, with phenomena like doom scrolling. The song is pretty complex though and can be interpreted in different ways, but what do you guys think about this theory? PFAS Carcinogenic Forever Chemicals we have heard this hot new word everywhere as of late, or at least I have recently, PFAS being one of them. Forever chemicals can be found in things like nonstick pans, fast food wrappers, nail polish, dental floss, cleaning products, water resistant clothing, pesticides. I can keep on going for a while off this never ending list. The point is that it's not good for us as human beings and could lead to things such as cancer and so on. The scary thing is, is that these substances do not break down explaining the forever and forever chemicals. Now, here's something alarming. According to a 2023 study by the US Geological Survey, 45% of all the nation's tap water contains one or more types of PFAS, forever chemicals, and those are the only ones that we can detect so far, as the USGS admits that they can only detect up to 32 types. Who knows what other kinds of chemicals are in there? Interestingly enough, the study was the first of its kind to test for these substances in regulated public and private water supplies throughout the country. And get this, the samples were collected directly from people's kitchen sinks, meaning we might have been zipping on the zombie water for a while, or at least some of us have. I know my mom told me not to drink from the tap when I was a kid, although sometimes I would. Current studies suggest that exposure to these chemicals may lead to things such as reproductive effects such as decreased fertility or increased high blood pressure in pregnant women, developmental effects or delays in children including low birth weight, accelerated puberty, bone variations or behavioral changes, increased risks of some cancers, including prostate, kidney, and testicular cancers, reduced ability of the body's immune system to fight infections, including reduced vaccine response, interference with the body's natural hormones, increased cholesterol levels and or risk of obesity, and all this data is coming to us from the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. Although there are thousands of PFAS, most studies only pay attention to a small number of them, well-known ones with the possibility of different effects and levels of toxicity, making it hard to track and assess specific chemicals and their effects on our health over time. 
It's a pretty complex issue, and because kids are still developing, the biggest fear is that these chemicals are more harmful to children due to them being more sensitive and coming heavily into contact with them as they drink more water, eat more food, and breathe more air per pound of body weight compared to adults. Younger children also tend to put things into their mouth, which can come into contact with PFAS in carpets, dust, and cleaning products. They even conducted a study finding that more than 96% of Americans have at least one PFAS in their blood. Now, you may be thinking, I drink bottled water, I should be safe, right? Well, not exactly. According to this lovely study titled Detection of Ultra Short Chain and Other Per and PFAS in U.S. Bottled Water, in which they screened for 32 PFAS, they found that 39 out of the 101 bottled water brands that they tested contained PFAS, and one bottled water brand in particular even had 15 out of the 32 PFAS substances they tested for, though they didn't publicize the brands that were tested, so I guess we gotta guess. Though you may be safe, as they also found that bottled waters that were labeled as purified contained less PFAS compared to spring water, which didn't go through a reverse osmosis filtering method, which that method may be the reason for less contamination in purified water. Meaning that the water might not be turning the freaking frogs gay. I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the freaking frogs gay. Ugh, ugh, serious crap. But it may be leading to cancer and a plethora of other negative effects. Jesus Hong. This is a reference to the Family Guy scene where Stewie crosses over to the other side and finds out that Jesus is actually named Jesus Hong, not Jesus Christ, and that he's Chinese. An interesting joke touching on the topic of a man named Hong Yo Chen. This man was the self-proclaimed brother of Jesus Christ himself. Born in 1814, his father was a farmer and local official who invested in his son's future through the form of education. Sadly, he would go on to fail his imperial examinations and would be forced to work in agriculture. Though, at the age of 22 years old, he would return back to the city of Guangzhou to retake the imperial examinations. During his stay there, he would witness a foreign missionary by the name of Edwin Stevens preaching Christianity to the locals, even receiving a pamphlet from them titled Good Words for Exhorting the Age, written by the missionaries' his interpreter, Liang Fa. These pamphlets contained Bible verses and other materials, which Hong would briefly look over but not pay much attention to, and would fail his examination for the second time. In 1837, he would go back to retry the test, but would fail again for the third time, causing his mental breakdown, and being delirious for days. During this time, he would dream of visiting heaven and meeting his heavenly father and of course his brother, Jesus Christ, alongside other heavenly family members. His heavenly father would then argue to him that people on earth were worshipping demons instead of himself, giving Hong a sword and golden seal to slay the demons with. For the next several years, he would go upon a normal life, teaching at schools, not really acting upon the supposed mission given to him by God. That is, until 1843, when he failed his exam for the fourth time, prompting a visit from his cousin, who would inspire him to read the Christian pamphlets. That's when he had his awakening, making him realize who all those people were in his vision from years ago. They were the Christian figures from the book. Upon this revelation, he would burn all his Confucian and Buddha statues in his house and the books. Preaching to his friends and family about his vision, they would join him in this revolution of sorts by going into small villages and destroying their idols. Due to the actions of Hong and his converts being viewed as sacrilegious, Confucians persecuted them and had them resign from their posts as village instructors. One day, he decided to go visit his cousin up in this rural mountainous area, only to find thousands of followers who proclaimed him to be the Messiah, so he stayed and lived amongst them. And by 1850, he had somewhere between 10,000 to 30,000 devout followers. By that time, the God-worshipping society had expanded to four areas in China, declaring war against the demons who they finally noted to be the Qing dynasty, the final dynasty of China, ruling from 1644 to 1912. By 1852, they had gathered 2 million followers, known as Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, who were loyal to them over the Qing Dynasty. He even tried to seize Beijing, but failed. 
Hong was then found dead in 1864. Some say he was poisoned, others say he ended his own life, which eventually led to the fall of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. Yangno In Korean folklore, there exists a demon creature by the name of Yangno, described as a demon that eats the rich. More specifically, this entity eats the Yangban of Korea, a social class of noblemen who were known to have power and prestige among society in medieval Korea's class system period, standing at the top of the Korean class system. Though not much is known about the creature's lore, it is often seen in theatrical plays in different regions within the country. In one specific play titled Su Young Yo Yu, it is revealed that these young no creatures were casted out from the heavens after committing crimes, inhabiting earth with the main purpose of consuming 100 of these rich folks known as the Yangban. If they complete this mission, it is said that they gain entry back into heaven. Normally, these creatures have a long red slash orange face with scaly material usually draped over the person who is playing them. They also hold the flutes or willow pipe that they play in order to alert individuals that they are present. The only seeming weakness of the Yangno is its empathy towards its own family members, meaning that it is loyal to its relatives and the rich could escape them by simply claiming that they are the father or grandpa of the creature, which in turn will show mercy, respecting the family member by not eating them, showing the nobility of the Yangno creature in contrast to the lying rich man, though most Yangban would boast about their nobility and get eaten anyways. In real life, the young bun, the rich class, actually enjoyed watching the characters, as the demon was entertaining to them. March 2nd, CIA report on Stalin. This entry is in reference to the declassified CIA report that seems to praise Stalin. Not only that, it also admits that the West exaggerated in the way they reported leadership as dictatorship in a communist sit-up. The CIA report states, even in Stalin's time, there was collective leadership. The Western idea of a dictator within the communist setup is exaggerated. Misunderstandings on that subject are caused by lack of comprehension of the real nature and organization of the communist power structure. Stalin, although holding wide powers, was merely the captain of a team, and it seems obvious that Khrushchev will be the new captain. However, it does not appear that any of the present leaders will arise to the stature of Lenin and Stalin, so that it will be safer to assume that developments in Moscow will be along the lines of what is called collective leadership, unless Western policies force the Soviets to streamline their power organization. The present situation is the most favorable from the point of view of upsetting the communist dictatorship since the death of Stalin. There will not be a dramatic purge, and as much as the MVD, the Ministry of Internal Affairs, has already been cleaned up, and the party and the army have not been in the hands of Malenkov's favorites there can be expected only a normal replacement of officials and the reorganization of the top-level administration of the party and the government. It is hard to draw any parallel between present events and those of the 1920s when Stalin was ascending to power. There is now no organized opposition inside the party or in the Soviet Union in general. As the communist rulers and evidently also the Soviet people see it, there is a grave outside menace. Since the death of Stalin and the blow which was given to the power of the secret police, the Soviet internal situation has been in a state of flux. The new Soviet setup needs time for consolidation. The struggle between national-minded Titoist elements in the Soviet leadership and those who think in terms of the more orthodox international line is still going on. No improvement in the food situation can be expected. The promises of Malenkov to improve the poor material conditions of the masses were not kept, and as much as the communist leaders were unable to keep this promise, particularly because of accelerated war preparations, they had to find a scapegoat, and thus Malenkov resigned. Bulganin impressed those who had worked with him in the state's bank, including a famous expert on banking, with his high intelligence, mild manners, and capacity to learn in a very short time the most special and difficult problems. It is difficult to anticipate any withdrawal from the Soviet foreign policy line unless there are concessions from the West with regard to the ratification of the Paris agreements. There is a possibility that a continuation of discord among the Soviet leaders may lead to a softening of the Soviet position and to a recognition by Molotov 
Molotov of his incompetence in the conduct of foreign relations. The Soviet leaders, however, have recognized that the balance of power has changed in favor of the West. They are now endeavoring to change this balance, as can be seen from the shift to accelerated war production and the attempts to disrupt Western unity. The aggressiveness of the Chinese communists may also be part of this endeavor. A stiff position on the part of the West towards the USSR probably favors the continuation in power of the more stiff elements in the Soviet leadership. Basically saying if the West keeps on pushing the USSR with policy, they will continue to be strict with their governing, in ways the West might not like. Spontaneous generation is real. So, the spontaneous generation theory states that living creatures could arise from non-living matter, like say for instance mud, sand, or rotten apple, an old banana peel. People thought that fleas could randomly arise out of dust, or that flies could arise out of something like rotten meat for example. Aristotle being the first to record his thoughts on spontaneous generation, writing about how maggots would emerge from rotten meats, and this guy's idea went seemingly unchallenged for almost 2000 years. People believed this to be true, until 1668 when Francisco Reddy disproved spontaneous generation with his jar experiments, where he took three jars and put a slice of meat in each. One had no lid, one had a mesh lid, and one had a tightly sealed lid. He then let them sit for a while until the flies were collecting, and found that the decaying meat did not produce the maggots. They had only appeared on the jar with no lid, where the flies were able to come in contact with the meat. They did not appear in the jars where the rotten meats were isolated. And then in 1748, John Needham sought to disprove Reddy's experiments by building on top of the discovery of living organisms not visible to the naked eye through Van Leeuwenhoek's first true microscope discovering microorganisms. He called them animacules though. What if these microscopic living organisms come from something like the meat itself, proving spontaneous generation true? So Needham started by setting up a round bottom flask with gravy and then heating it for a while in the effort to kill any living organisms inside of the gravy. He then proceeded to loosely seal it and observed. Thinking that all the organisms inside the flask were dead, he believed that the only way that living organisms could appear in the gravy was if they spontaneously generated from the gravy itself. And to his surprise, living organisms began to appear in the gravy. They started to generate in the loosely sealed jar, concluding that Francisco Reddy was wrong all along. But keep in mind the word loosely sealed, meaning it was still exposed to the outside air, leaving room for contamination. He also didn't heat the flask to a high enough temperature for a long enough time. But then in 1861, Pasteur's Swan Nick flask experiment took place, where Louis Pasteur took two glass flasks in the shape of a swan's neck, in this shape, and put nutrient broth in them, bringing them to a boiling temperature to kill any microbes. Once sterilized, Pasteur broke the neck off one of the flasks, leaving the broth exposed to surrounding air. The other flask was left untouched. After a while, he found that the dust settled into the open air flask that had its neck broken, but the other open air flask that was still intact had dust collecting, but at the end of the swan neck, not being able to work against gravity and travel up the neck of the flask, it couldn't contaminate the broth. While the broken neck flask showed microbial life growing and clouding the sample, the other fully intact one showed no life at all. The broth remained clear finally debunking spontaneous generation. First religion was animism. Described as the earliest known religion, predating even large organized religions like Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, animism is described as the attribution of a soul to things like plants, inanimate objects like masks to a rock, and natural phenomena like a river or mountain. Believing in a supernatural power that has control over things and animates the universe. When European anthropologists began to study quote-unquote primitive religions, they studied the indigenous cultures of Australia, Africa, island nations, and the Americas, thinking that they were still stuck on levels 1 and 2 of the religious evolutionary stage, describing them as quote-unquote low races, they took advantage. From this study, they hypothesized that our ancestors couldn't clearly distinguish between reality and dream, causing them to believe that their dead relatives were still alive somewhere else even after death because they saw them in a dream. 
basically describing their beliefs as childlike mistakes, confusing reality with the dreams they had. This ultimately helped develop an early idea of souls and spirits in non-living things, according to anthropologist E.B. Tyler. He believed that religion started with animism. An example could be early humans believing volcanoes were spiritual beings, then evolved to polytheism, a belief in multiple gods like Hinduism, then to monotheism, the belief that there is only one god, an example being Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, though some people do argue that the trinity concept in Christianity excludes them from being monotheists. But that's besides the point. All this would lead to the pinnacle of human understanding through the use of science, basically our current evolutionary phase and quote-unquote religion according to Tyler. But of course, science isn't a religion, so I guess we transcended from that according to him. Instead of attributing all things in life to a creator, we use science to rationalize the universe. But of course, this was only his theory. And as time went on, scholars began to dispute his ideas, as they were backed by not-so-trustworthy sources. During the time he lived and conducted his study on these African, Australian, and American indigenous cultures, he used the sources on their religions that were tainted with Christian influence, meaning that the religions were not the same as they were thousands of years ago before first contact with Europeans. They had Christian elements mixed into their beliefs, or it had affected their original original religious practices in one way or another. The data used was heavily flawed. For example, take the ancient Greeks. They used the science and math to create and explain the things around them, while at the same time being polytheistic, only one step above animism. And according to Tyler's theory, that would make the ancient Greeks a primitive culture, which is ridiculous considering they shaped modern mathematics and philosophy, amongst other things. Morality is subjective. Morality is described at its simplest form as principles used to distinguish between right and wrong behavior. So if you say that morality is subjective, it means that each individual comes up with their own morality influenced by their personal beliefs and feelings. Ultimately, there is no universal right and wrong according to this theory. It's all based on your opinion. The overall picture painted seems bleak at first, as most if not everything that we describe as quote unquote evil in a morality is objective world can be self-justified if you believe that morality is subjective. And this is a pretty dark subject to speak about once you consider all the horrific things human beings have done throughout history. But the question still stands and has been debated for a long time. Some argue that since science can prove things to be true or false, the same goes for morality. Things are inherently right or wrong, and it's set in stone like that in our brains, adding that there are core fundamental values that are shared amongst all cultures throughout time that never changed, though this can easily be disproven when considering certain cultures that have had or have core values that don't align with ours. Does that make our culture's morality objectively right, or are we in the wrong? Only one side can have the objective true set of core values, unless we live in a morally subjective world. Some also argue that morality derived from evolution, therefore it's objective, explaining that fairness and compassion are the founding values morality stands on. The reason we see these traits in the actions of chimpanzees, the closest living relatives of humans, alpha male chimps who show less empathy to other chimps are held accountable for their actions and their small societies. On the other hand, the alpha male chimps who tend to show more empathy to others are more favorable in their community. Empathy is also used by apes to topple the current standing alpha if they are the runner-up to the top. And of course, just like humans, they are shown to be more empathetic to apes in their circle than to outsiders. There was also an experiment published on the altruism of chimpanzees, where they asked the question, do chimps care about the welfare of others? 
They conducted this experiment by putting chimps side by side in different rooms and giving one of them access to green and red tokens with different exchanges. The red token was the selfish token and they could only exchange it for a single treat for themselves. The green token was the pro-social token and it could be exchanged for a single treat for themselves and a single treat for the chimp in the other room as well. Though it was expected that the chimp with access to the tokens could care less because because they would get a treat either way, more than 55% plus of the time, they would choose the green token, even if the other chimp didn't show interest for a treat at that moment. When the other chimp did show interest in wanting a treat to the token having chimp, the pro-social green token was chosen more than 65% of the time, but when the other chimp demanded a treat and began applying pressure to the token having chimp, the token having chimp chose the green token less often. Maybe it found the other chimp annoying or something. And finally, the token having chimp with no partner in the other room chose the green token about 45% of the time, showing that they do care about their fellow chimps' well-being. There's also the Capuchin Monkey Fairness Experiment, where two monkeys are given rewards for conducting the same amount of work, giving a token in exchange for a treat, though one treat is better than the other. One is given only cucumber, while the other is given a much yummier treat, a grape. The one monkey given the cucumber quickly notices that he is given the lesser of the two for the same amount of work. He gives a token and demands a grape by throwing the cucumber back at the person giving out the treats, attempting to escape the cage and reaching for the grape container, knowing he's being treated unfairly. Ultimately, research has found that monkeys show more empathy towards those they know than to others, a human trait, but these values are only the basics of what makes up morality. In human societies, morality becomes much more complex. Many believe that our human moral compass derives from a creator or creators, aka religion, as they find that religion is the only basis of what determines right and wrong. Who or what was Luca? Luca stands for Last Universal Common Ancestor and refers to the last common ancestor of all life on Earth, a microbe that lived 4 billion years ago, from which the three domains of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya derived from including things like fungi, which belongs to a whole different kingdom of their own, separate from plants and animals. All different types of plants, trees, grass and hemp and whatnot, all the animals, from humans to whales, all bacteria, Luca's basically all of our greatest grandfather or grandmother, making us all related. Luca is described as the simplest life form, possibly composed of only 355 genes, compared to humans who have between 20,000 to 25,000 genes. It lived near high temperature environments, including hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor. Though there are still many aspects regarding this theory that are still up for debate amongst the scientists. Darwin was wrong. When people say Charles Darwin was wrong, they are attacking his theory of evolution by natural selection. His book, titled On the Origin of Species, published in 1859, explained that all living organisms went through the process of change, or evolved, over many generations by inheriting a variation of traits. Simply put, if an animal has specific traits that increase their chances of survival and have more babies, their babies will inherit those traits, which help them adapt to their environment, as opposed to animals with less adaptive traits. Many of them end up dying before passing them on to the next generation. Over a long enough time period, traits in a species that help them adapt to their environments better and live to reproduce will be more frequent in the population, causing the population as a whole to change, or as we know it, evolve. Though some creationists argue that, sure, Microevolution can occur within a species, for example, the way we breed different kinds of dogs. It is much different than macroevolution, on the other hand. The creation of an entirely new species through evolution. That's not possible, according to them. Arguing that dogs do go through microevolution and have a great contrast from a pug to a German shepherd, but they never turn into a completely different species, a non dog, despite going through evolutionary change, meaning dogs never turned into a giant panda due to breeding. 
they all remain the same kind, a term used by believers of this theory, though this concept of evolution is heavily flawed, as the term kind is often given a subjective meaning, depending on the person and their beliefs. For example, many compare African elephants and Asian elephants, believing that they are the same kind of animal, but yet they cannot interbreed due to their genetic differences. They are two different species. Another argument raised is that of irreducible complexity, stating that a given system in a cell with many moving parts which are required for its function would not function if even one of those parts were removed, ultimately meaning that it could not have evolved from a less complex system. It would have needed an already functioning blueprint of the system for it to work. All components would have needed to be made at the same time in relation to one another. This has even convinced some that there is an intelligent creator of the universe, citing the complexity of the bacterial flagellar motor that works, well, basically like an intelligently designed outboard motor, as some would put it, composed of multiple rings containing components like a drive shaft, a rotor, a stator, the FLIG that regulates the direction of the motor's rotation and determines the flagellar's swimming behavior, all of this powering a tail that functions like a propeller, moving the bacteria through its environment in order to find a nutrient working almost like a man-made machine. Instead, it's a nano-machine, all natural. Of course, from our point of view, if a car had no engine, it couldn't run. It would just be a body frame with wheels, pretty useless. In order for it to run, it would need an engine for it to be a fully assembled car. The point being that the components of the bacterial flagellar motor couldn't have arisen out of evolution because they needed to be put together by an outside force in order to have a function. Otherwise, those components evolving alone in the cell would be useless. It's like building a bike frame before discovering what a wheel is. It would be impossible according to believers of this theory, arguing that there is a super intelligent creator behind it all becoming the leading argument in defense of intelligent design, though there are many that have already debunked this idea. Rig Veda The Rig Veda is considered to be one of the oldest collections of religious texts, full of hymns and philosophical ideas. It is estimated to have been composed between 1900 and 1200 BCE, though it is known to be older than that, as it is believed to have been passed down orally through generations before it was eventually written down. This scripture is only one of four that makes up something known as the Vedas, the first being the Rig Veda, the Samaveda, Yajurveda, and Atharvaveda, a collection of what we know to be history, mythology, poems, hymns, ritual instructions, and cures for different diseases, making the basis of what is understood as classical Hinduism. The Rig Veda is also the oldest surviving example of Sanskrit, an ancient Indo-European language arriving from India and the ancestor language of many northern Indian languages, though many argue the point that the earliest known physical copy of written Sanskrit we have found dates back to only 100 BCE. Before the Big Bang What was before the Big Bang? Probably nothing, and some think that asking that question is rather nonsensical. Comparing the question to asking, what is more south than the South Pole? Nothing, right? The question is impossible to answer, due to the fact that the concept of time as we know it began with the Big Bang itself. So how does one conceptualize the meaning of a before without the existence of time? It's hard and fun to imagine, right? The visible universe as we see it today was once tiny, very hot and dense, expanding or exploding as some refer to it, to create everything. This moment occurred 13.8 billion years ago. Recently, in just the last 50 years or so, scientists have known of the cosmic microwave background in our universe, referred to as fossil radiation. It's known as the shockwave that was released after the Big Bang happened, theorized to have created the first atoms in the universe. This fossil radiation caused the universe to be the color orange, or like a pale glowing orange, for millions of years because of the charged particles in space being several thousand degrees. It was too hot for even galaxies to form in that period. 
This cosmic microwave background CMB reveals the picture of a 400,000 year old universe, a very young picture of the universe that occurred soon after the Big Bang. Going further back than that, the universe begins to get hotter and hotter, as opposed to going further in time as the universe expands and cools. What occurred exactly before the expansion is currently unknown to science, but there are still some ideas that are proposed. We aren't completely in the dark. One theory put forth states that the source of the energy that caused the expansion of the universe derived from the strong nuclear force transitioning from one state into another. One out of the four known forces in our universe, those being electromagnetism, weak interaction, strong interaction, the one related to this theory, and gravitation, all of them merging to create a single force, a theory supported by experiments at CERN. You know that place where they have that large hadron collider. Before all of the known physical laws existed, that is what was before the Big Bang. So currently we cannot explain what exactly occurred before anything occurred. We're running into a wall again. And I just hate not getting an answer, but it seems so far that nobody knows. The question isn't logical or we can't conceive what it was before everything we know. Some believe that the universe was always existing, but it was in another state always existing relative to how it was before the Big Bang, because it's theorized that time didn't exist as we understand it now before the Big Bang. Maybe another dimension exists that we may not understand just yet, beyond our understanding of space and time, and that could explain what existed before the Big Bang. Aztec Myths First, the preface. This explanation will have to be generalized somewhat for the iceberg's sake, but I am working on a single video alone, touching on Mesoamerican culture as a whole, so stay tuned for that on the channel. When one thinks of the Aztec civilization, the first things that come to mind seem to be pyramids, the calendar, and of course, human sacrifice. Let me clarify some things first before we get into the nitty gritty. What we know to be Aztecs were actually called the Mexica or more precisely the Tenochca Mexica who lived in Tenochtitlan in what is now present day Mexico City. The name Aztec didn't come until way later, around 1810, when Alexander von Humboldt used the name Aztec to describe the Mexica Empire, adapting the name from the Nahua word Aztlan, the name for their historical origin homeland. The Mexica were also only a part of a much larger group known as the Nahua who spoke Nahuatl. Words like chocolate, chili, chipotle, coyote, tomato, and avocado derive from this language and culture. The name Mexico derives from the name Mexica as well. The story is that they came from a place known as Atzlan, known to be somewhere in the southern United States and northern Mexico traveling southward or from somewhere so up for debate at the request of their god Huatzilopochtli to establish a new settlement. This is known because the Mexica language shares features with those of the Hopi and the Utes natives of the American Southwest. They are all part of the uto aztecan languages, which are theorized to have originated from here, the American Southwest. Early colonial books depict the people making the journey on foot. Huitzilopochtli, their god, then told them to look for an eagle resting on top of a cactus, a sign indicating the place to settle. This migration led them to the Valley of Mexico, where they found the city structures of Teotihuacan, which were already built and inhabited at one point in history between roughly 100 BC and 550 AD by the Teotihuacan people not the Mexica or Aztecs, not yet, until its final collapse of course, but during that time, it was one of the most populated cities on earth, filled with different types of people from around the area, like the Zapotecs and Mayans. They even had their own neighborhoods in the city. Think of it like a New York. They all coexisted in this one place with beautiful apartments. Yes, apartments with functional indoor plumbing for waste, roofless rooms for ventilation, decorated walls with beautiful art, and more. It wasn't only the pyramids they made. Teotihuacan was diverse and rich in multiple cultures, unlike the Aztec civilization who had a history of kings like Montezuma II, Teotihuacan left no traces of a single king in power, no royal burial or anything. There's even a lack of monuments that would suggest a king, leading to the conclusion that it may have been a ruling council instead, with the representatives from each culture that inhabited the city, explaining their peaceful coexistence with each other in the city. Soon after their mysterious gradual fading away, the Toltecs took over the region and began to conquer many kingdoms in Mesoamerica, ruling as far east as the Yucatan to as far north as southern Arizona. A great seven-year famine is theorized 
to have ended in though, and the region was rather empty and up for grabs at that later point in time when the Mashika finally arrived from the north, the Aztecs as some still call them finding an eagle on top of a cactus on an island in Lake Texacoco, modern day Mexico City. This was to be the land to settle according to their mythology. This is where they built their powerful city Tenochtitlan, not to be confused with Teotihuacan. They were completely different places. They didn't build these pyramids as some mistakenly believe. They did build these structures though. Little of their ruins remain located in the heart of Mexico City as of now, because the Spanish and their allies Tlaxcala buried and destroyed most of their temples, though you can still find some remains like their Temple Mayor and more artifacts are still being unearthed today. Though the Mexica did not build Teotihuacan, they found it of great importance and revered it as the birthplace of the gods, translating to Teotihuacan in their language, so that's where the name comes from. The original name of the city is unknown. Now for their calendar, this massive thing was known as the sunstone and it would have originally been painted, it wasn't colorless, painted to define certain areas on the stone. Now a lot of people believe this to be the Mayan calendar that predicted the end of time to be on the 21st of December 2012, but this is untrue. This was the Mayan calendar that ended in 2012 and started the craze. And also the Mayans didn't think that the world was going to end on that day either, it was simply the end of their calendar. It's not like it could go on forever. That whole end of the world concept was simply a fun Hollywood idea that they wanted to cash in on. The Mexica or Aztec calendar is still so fascinating nonetheless and even explains their reasoning and practice of human sacrifice. You see, the center of the Aztec calendar is split in five eras or the five suns as they thought of it. These four sections surrounding the sun god in the middle, the fifth sun, inside of those four boxes are the names of the past suns slash eras that once existed and how they ended. The first is death by jaguar, the second is death by heavy winds, the third is death by rains of fire, and fourth is death by water. And the last era slash sun, the one that we are in today, is death by earthquakes. Earthquakes are a common occurrence in Mexico, so it makes sense why they might have concluded with this. The myth is that the sun slash era that we are currently in was created by two gods or several gods who sacrificed themselves in Teotihuacan, the ancient city to them and to us as well. The first god sacrificed himself to create the sun and the second did it to set the sun in motion and because the gods were so gracious enough to sacrifice themselves for the creation of the sun for the benefit of humans, the humans, the Aztecs, now had to keep on with the sacrifice of living beings as offerings to feed these gods so they would continue to keep the sun alive and in motion. And it's interesting when you compare this to other cultures throughout history, like the ancient Carthage who ruled the western Mediterranean for example, who sacrificed their young to gods. Even the ancient Greeks participated in human sacrifice to appease Zeus on Mount Lycaon, found in 2016, and their mythology often spoke of these rituals occurring, though they seem to have shifted to animal sacrifice at some point instead. This practice is even seen in many cultures throughout history all around the world, begging the question why did this even become a thing that even in isolated cultures was still prominent? Is there an evolutionary explanation for this? Like even Christianity bases its faith on the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus dying on the cross for humanity. The concept parallels the Aztec myth in similar ways. I don't know. What do you guys think about this? Nihilism is truth. Nihilism in its simplest form is described as the rejection of all religious and moral principles and the belief that life is meaningless. Though nihilism can be much more intricate than just believing in nothing to some, different positions exist in the matter. Many believe that all moral principles stand on nothing and cannot be objective. Even trying to attempt to find meaning in life is meaningless because at the end of your life it would have all been for nothing from your own perspective. You'd just be dead. The most popular and understood concept of nihilism comes from Friedrich Nietzsche, describing in particular existential nihilism, encompassing all forms of nihilism, where life in its entirety has no meaning and no true value, despite humanity's attempts to find value in everything. According to Nietzsche, nihilism is described as the radical repudiation of value, meaning, and desirability. Repudiation means the rejection of an idea, therefore a nihilist would reject finding value in anything 
reject finding meaning in anything, and they would desire nothing. A seeming opponent to nihilism would be religion, like Christianity for example, though that's not exactly true. Christianity gives you a road to take in life with defined morals and high unworldly values. It gives many people a meaning to life. It assures one that at the end of life, there is a heaven or a hell, leaving people to question how they should conduct themselves in the eyes of God while here on earth, so they reach heaven. So in a life with no inherent meaning, it is the medicine to a person seeking comfort and direction. Though as science advanced throughout history, it challenged many religious beliefs and ideas. And it seems like Friedrich Nietzsche could foresee the death of Christianity in the West and was frightened by the idea of a totally godless society in the future. A world that had an almost infinite amount of questions with very few answers, as opposed to a religious society that presumed everything could be explained through God and the afterlife. All you had to do was seek the truth, the way it was for a long time. But even then, Nietzsche believed Christianity to also be a form of nihilism, as the earth is simply seen as a bridge to the afterlife for some, and not our only existence, because Christians believe they will spend an eternity with God. But while they are here on earth, many focus on seeking the higher values instead of the lower values that easily satisfy people while they're still alive in the flesh. Instead of finding this world's lower values as adequate enough and investing in this world, they invest in the next one to come. Therefore, Christians are also nihilists in Nietzsche's eyes, as they have a will that is opposed to life and seeks refuge in heaven, afterlife. Nietzsche believed that nihilism was the logical conclusion of Christianity. Christian dogma leads to many questions and theories, because humans yearn for set values. All of that amounted to the age of scientific rationality in Europe, leading many to become skeptical of a heaven or hell concluding that all things learned through religion are merely objective, and that religious systems and ideals were simply a form of passive nihilism. Instead of depending on religious doctrine to base their values off of, an active nihilist destroys that foundation and takes that matter into their own hands, forming their own personal meaning and values in life. MR1 Protein and the Cure to All Cancers this one's mind-blowing, and proved that there may be one cure for all cancers in the near future. For the majority of cancer research history, experts believed that, that a single cure for all types of cancer was impossible, based on the assertion that cancer isn't just one disease, but more of an umbrella term for hundreds of them that affect people in unique ways. Take for instance the super effective immunotherapy drugs that have produced many positive results. They work well, but only for certain types of cancers, not most of them. This is where the MR1 protein comes in. Researchers at Cardiff University in Wales have found that they could use immune cells that go by the name of killer T cells to recognize the MR1 protein, a protein that is constant in the cells of the human population. Finding that the MR1 could then be used as a universal target across all types of cancers, or at least most, allowing healthy cells to remain untouched, leaving the immune system to only kill the cancer cells. And this was all because somehow this new T cell receptor could differentiate between a healthy or a cancer cell through the MR1 molecule on the cancer's surface. It just knew it was cancer and began killing it. Here's a great diagram from Cardiff showing how it all occurs. So this is the cancer cell. The MR1 molecule is on the surface of the cancer cell. The new T cell receptor is then added to the T cell, allowing it to bind to the MR1 molecule on the surface. The killer T cell then attacks and the cancer cell then dies as the T cell goes along its way to patrol and kill other cancer cells. The astonishing thing about it all is that they came across this by accident when conducting research on ways to fight bacteria using killer T cells, only utilizing a cancer cell as a host for the different types of bacteria that they aimed at killing. T cells aren't only helpful in fighting infection though, they also carry the job of detecting and attacking cancer, so they weren't so surprised when they found one T cell in particular that they were using, destroying not only bacteria, but also the cancer cell itself. They even tested its effects on cancer cells 
cells without bacteria in them, and it still killed the cancer. But they weren't impressed just yet. They questioned whether or not this T cell would be effective enough to kill other types of cancer, not just this particular cancer cell that they were working with that was prone to being infected with bacteria, as this was the main reason they were using it for the study. And so they decided to test the T cell against other types of cancer, like lung, skin, blood, colon, breast, bone, prostate, ovarian, kidney, and cervical cancer cells, discovering that yes, it indeed was effective in killing all these types of different cancers, a groundbreaking discovery in the field of cancer research. But would this work in humans? Well, they've only tested the therapy on mice so far and have seen promising results. The mice that had human cancers that were injected with the T cells equipped with a new T cell receptor that recognized cancers via the MR1 molecule showed, as the Cardiff article put it, encouraging cancer clearing results. If this translates well to humans, it would be the world's first universal T-cell medicine for many cancers and would make the treatment more cost effective, not only financially but timely, as it would make it possible to start treating cancer patients faster, saving more lives. Though the most important concern before experimenting on humans is to ensure that the T-cell will only target cancer cells and not healthy ones, which would be bad, but more study on the T-cell receptor is still needed. Kalapa. This term refers to the smallest units of physical matter, smaller than even a single particle of dust, a term used in a Theravada, Buddhist phenomenology. Theravada being the name of Buddhism's oldest existing school, and phenomenology meaning the aspects and or experiences of a religion, in this case Buddhism, though some consider it to be more of a philosophy. Though Kalapa is not specifically mentioned in the earliest known Buddhist texts, it does appear in the Abhidhamatha. Sangaha, a Buddhist guide of traditions or instruction manual, speculated to have been written between the 8th century and the 12th century, so around the same time as the High Middle Ages in Europe, just for a comparison. The Abdhid Hamatha Sangha describes Kalapas as invisible under normal human circumstances, only becoming visible when under deep meditation, when one reaches the result of Samadhi through meditation. Samadhi is a state of consciousness, the final of eight elements or practices of the Noble Eightfold Path that eventually lead to Nirvana, the liberation of the painful cycle of rebirth known as Samsara. The examination and focus of kalapas is a kind of vipassana practice used in modern Buddhist meditation that seeks to permit direct awareness of impermanence and non-self. Some believe that these mentioned kalapas are what we now know to be atoms, as they are described in the writing similarly, though not exact, but once you reach a deep enough meditation, some describe seeing trillions of these kalapas coming in and out of reality, performing a wave-like effect in their perspective helping one to understand the concept of anicca, meaning unstable, impermanent, and inconstant, relating to the Buddhist doctrine that all existence is temporary. And those were all the theories and or mysteries I have for you today. If you enjoyed the video, consider subscribing to the channel, and I'll catch you guys on the next video. Later.